Right, we'll start, make a start. Tēnā koto katoa. Kia ora, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to day two of the fourth annual uh, meeting of the um, South and West Pacific uh, Regional Centre for CB2030. Um, we had uh, some very interesting talks yesterday. If you didn't make it yesterday, um, there is recording available um, in the chat um, and it will be available on the YouTube channel as well for those who want to see it. Um, just some housekeeping uh, while you're on the call, can I ask that you all have your cameras off and microphones muted? Um, if you want to raise a question, please use the raise hand option. Um, and for the record, we are recording this message. The uh, recording's already started. So this, this uh, today's session will be recorded as well and it will be made available um, soon after today's session finishes. So um, just at, uh, during yesterday, we asked a, um, a couple of uh, poll questions. I'm just going to go over the results of yesterday's polls. Um, and we asked uh, two questions. Um, the first one is where you're listening from. Um, and to some really interesting uh, answers there. I love the Challenger Deep. I think that's Roxy out in the Challenger Deep. That's really great to see you phoning in from uh, the deepest part of the ocean. I think that's absolutely amazing. And we got some um, great distribution of um, uh, locations around the world. Um, we had 64 people on yesterday, so we had 44 responses to this poll, so not everybody responded. And the second question we asked was, have you downloaded the Jebco grid in the last year? Um, pretty even split, 50-50 between yes or no. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, several responses um, indicated this is the first time they even knew about Jebco or CB2030 in its products. So it's really great to have those people on the call. And I hope they've uh, really learned what CB2030 and Jebco is about. So um, we'll rip straight into today's agenda. Um, I'm going to pass the um, the chair of the session over to Dr. Dr. Jenny Black from GNS Science. Um, she's a geologist uh, based at New Zealand's Geological Institute, and she'll be running the first session today. So over to you, Jenny. Thanks, Kevin. Um, kia ora, everyone. Welcome to um, the first session of today. So our first talk is with Stuart Kai from Totua to Fenua Land Information New Zealand. So over to you, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, caught me off guard there. Bear with me, just trying to get over there. So. So I'm just trying to share some sound as well. Um, while Stuart's just getting that set up, I'll just remind everyone that if you've got questions, type them into this chat or raise your hand and after Stuart's talk, we'll ask all of those questions in one go to Stuart at the end. Thanks. Okay, I'll have to see you. your CBA 2030 banner. Oh, yeah, that's right. We'll see your slides. <laughs> well, we thought we'd, we, we thought we'd go full bore here uh, with with everything. So uh, hopefully you can you can see my screen there. Yes, we can. That's great. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Kiona Koto. Um, so uh, I'm standing in really for Adam Greenland, who's the chair of the South Pacific uh, Hydrographic Commission. Um, and really the intention is to provide an overview of the International Hydrographic Organization or the IHO and their strategic plan, which was published last, last year, and also the work of the Southwest Pacific Hydrographic uh, Commission. <clears throat> so the IHO strategic plan, uh, the purpose of the plan is to identify uh, specific strategic goals and targets that will direct the IHO's work program. And this is split out into three goals. Uh, goal one is really around standards. And uh, in particular here, we're looking at the uh, S100 universal data model, which you may be familiar with. 
and uh, this is um, an approved baseline data model uh, which will support the IMO e-navigation program. Uh, and goal two is focused on data and increasing the use of hydrographic data for the benefit of society. And in particular, one of the targets under this goal is uh, applying the UN shared guiding principles for geospatial information management. And the third goal there is, is around <coughs> knowledge, uh, participating in international initiatives. And really this is a um, us connecting with the Nippon Foundation Jebco Seabed 2030 project. So just looking at the S100, maybe more the, the goal one, um, most be aware of the move to this S100, and we're currently two years into the decade of implementation for S100. And the aim is that from 2025, uh, S100 or S1XX products will be available. Uh, and there'll be a period of time uh, that's going to be known as dual fuel. So when the new products and the current products, the S57, um, are used uh, in parallel. Uh, and although it's known as S100, you may see um, on the screen here, I'm going to highlight them, some other um, other branded. So we've got S201. Uh, so the S2XX uh, products, they come under uh, relate to ACE navigation and they come under the auspices of the International Association of Marine ACE Navigation uh, and Lighthouse Authorities or IALA uh, and then uh, S4XX uh, which are more about the, in, in this particular instance S412 which is a weather overlay and uh, that really comes under the uh, WMO's auspices. Um, so there's a number of S100 products that are in the first tranche and are really around route planning uh, become the more the uh, mandatory uh, products related to na navigation safety. Um, and what I've got here is just a short video that introduces it a little bit more and uh, gives more e detail around the purpose of S100. So it's, this is really going beyond navigation safety. It's into other other realms. So uh, hopefully this video will work and there is a little bit of sound. Okay, so just uh, a short video there that kind of shows um, it's beyond safe navigation, uh, but really it's uh, around our oceans as well. Uh, so moving on to the work of the South West Pacific Hydrographic Commission. Um, this is a regional hydrographic commission under the IHO, and the idea is that these commissions uh, coordinate uh, hydrographic activities and cooperation at a regional level. The uh, 
RHCs, the commissions are made up of IHO member states um, together with other um, regional coastal states. So uh, on the screen there you can see the, uh, the members and associate members um, within our group. We have 11 member states, six uh, associate members. And the Commission is active in delivering capacity building activities in the region, and these are funded uh, through the IHO Capacity Building Fund. And this also will, will include this coming um, in February, uh, we're going to be having a two day capacity building workshop on hydrographic governance, and that's going to be held just before the next Commission meeting in February. So following on from the publication of the IHO strategic plan, uh, the Commission undertook a piece of work to develop a work plan that will develop to um, the strategic plan in our region. Uh, so in addition to the three IHO goals, we have a Commission specific goal that's there to increase our influence at the IHO and other international bodies. And then we have uh, three targets were defined under that particular uh, goal and uh, four activities were identified that then will come to in a, in a minute. So goals uh, of particular interest here, uh, just highlighted in, in uh, red boxes, it might be difficult for you to see on the screen, but there is a link at the bottom of that slide that will take you to the page where you can find this work plan. Um, so interest here, the activities that are related to the use of new tools and methods, to increase uh, the coverage in a region by promoting uh, CSB and satellite drive bathymetry, and uh, also the adoption of the UNGTIM iGIF and sharing data. And under goal three, there is a uh, prime thing is engaging with the CBET 2030 project and collaborating on projects under the UN Decade of Ocean Science. Uh, so one of those uh, flagships has been a hydrographic leaders program and this will help us deliver to the, our particular regional uh, goal and uh, there is a cohort of about 17 participants at the moment uh, from 12 nations within the region and each uh, is, is matched with a mentor and so the program aims to build a leadership pipeline for representation of hydrographic activities in the region and uh, will build and encourage a network of leaders within the Hydrographic Commission in particular. Uh, and then this just gives an indication of uh, where the cohort have come from in the countries around the region. One of the other activities is supporting the IHO's Empowering Women in Hydrography project um, and uh, we are looking to put forward a a proposal to uh, get at least two people, one or two people, hopefully to attend the IHO Third Assembly in Monaco in April next year. And what we've also just completed uh, as of the 1st of July, we've uh, run a series of four webinars and this was based upon the uh, webinars presented in the Mesa Caribbean uh, Hydrographic Commission. Uh, four webinars, a uh, big thank you to Kevin Mackay, and also Jennifer Jenks, the director of the uh, IHO DCDB for uh, their participation and contribution to this. So we've taken through the webinars in understanding what are the goals for CBET 2030, um, how do we uh, build data, how do we contribute data, how do we share, how do we access data, and then looking at the moving ahead, what does that mean for us in the region, and what are some of those activities that go towards our work plan. Uh, and maybe more for a New Zealand focus. Um, New Zealand's or Toitu Te Whenua Lins were the first uh, government to sign a full memorandum of agreement with CBA 2030, and that was uh, this time last year. Uh, so just one of the topics that uh, we focused on at the previous commission meeting was this uh, IGIF, so the uh, Integrated Geospatial Information Framework and the value proposition for open data. We had a panel discussion there uh, that really set a couple of questions and um, the outcome of this session was the recognition uh, that to achieve goals two and three of the IHO strategic plan, then there is a real need to engage with international and regional agencies um, to help them and get them to adopt um, open data 
uh, right from the outset. So it's raising awareness of the importance of hydrography and the data that's collected and how that needs to be built into any uh, funded projects within the region. So just finishing off here with the top three challenges for us as a commission, uh, awareness, coordination and collaboration with uh, capacity building uh, and development activities within the region. We recognise that there are quite a few uh, different funded programmes um, by different donors. Uh, so really understanding what is going on, how can we not duplicate effort is key for us. Um, establishing hydrographic governance in our region, the coastal states, and hence the workshop that's going to be held just before the next commission meeting in February. And then the biggest challenge that we have is really engaging, coordinating with the agencies within our region or uh, internationally and those development partners, as I said, when they start to plan activities, really raising awareness of the benefits and importance of hydrography and how can they uh, adopt um, open data policies um, and uh, practices to make that, uh, make that available. So as a commission, we raise this as a paper to the IHO uh, and now as a region we're um, looking to work with other IHO members to develop a strategy and implementation framework for hydrographic commissions to engage in that space um, and really making it um, uh, obvious and support for this open data. Hence, we're very keen uh, in developing this, this uh, value proposition to uh, really be able to tell the story of the benefits of hydrography and making that data available and sharing it uh, for the greater good. Uh, so thank you. Um, any questions, more than happy to take them just now or whenever. And I uh, hope to see you uh, at uh, the next commission meeting, which you got the dates there in February. Uh, there are links there to the IHO website and also particularly to the South West Pacific uh, Commission website. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stuart. That was a really interesting talk. Um, if anyone does have any questions, use the raise hand feature or type into the chat and we can ask them to Stuart now. We've got a couple of minutes before the next talk. And maybe while people are thinking of um, questions or typing them in, I'll just ask a quick question if that's OK, Stuart. Um, yes. You mentioned the um, Hydrographic Leaders Programme. It sounded a really great initiative to kind of train the next generation and so on. I wondered if that's a one off or if it's something that will continue. Will there be another cohort next year or the year after or what the kind of future plan is for that? Yeah, so this is a pilot uh, project or program at the moment and uh, the first one that is being run and delivered. Um, and it's really it's looking at uh, taking the approach of a theory, a theory of change approach. So what, what do we need to be putting into place to, to make this change? Obviously, for us, we wanted to grow their influence. Um, so we're hopeful that. Um, so we're very grateful, actually, that most of this is being funded through the UK and the UKHO. Uh, but we would like to see this being picked up as a capacity building activity, you know, by the IHO and rolled out across the other uh, regional hydrographic commissions. So there is certainly interest in the IHO and other commissions for this program. Well, that's great to hear. I hope it is something that can spread and become bigger geographically and over time. Great. OK, well, um, thanks, Stuart. It doesn't look like there's any questions right now, but if anyone does think of any, type them into the chat. And if we have time um, at the end of this session, we'll come to those questions. So we'll move on to our um, second talk for this session. That's Hugo Montoro, who's going to talk about the status of seafloor mapping in Peru. So um, Hugo, Go ahead, feel free to start your talk. Thanks. You're muted still. Uh, could you hear me now? Yes, we can. OK, perfect. So. OK. OK. Uh, uh, greeting from the Southeast Pacific Ocean. So today I want to share with you um, a couple of things. It's going to be a very brief presentation, uh, but uh, what we want to share with you is uh, an, an important action uh, taken by the Peruvian state 
related with the uh, care of the ocean and in particular with the uh, ocean floor. On June 5th, 2021, uh, the Peruvian government declared as a marine protected area uh, a very important location, which is not connected uh, directly with the coast. Um, let me pass the presentation. I'm talking about this uh, th this Nazca area. As you can see in the slide, in the uh, this is the Peruvian the Peruvian map, and all these colors in this uh, in this map are presenting the protected areas or, or areas protected by the government, and all of them are located in the inland, in the Andes and the in the Amazon rainforest. But uh, this particular one area, uh, Nazca. It's, it's the first one located entirely in the ocean. So, um, these uh, maps are showing uh, this particular area. Um, as you know, uh, Nazca is a very important tectonic plate, and with the same name, we have uh, an important reach over, uh, running over this, uh, this tectonic plate. Uh, part of the significance uh, of uh, this act of recognition uh, is that this, uh, it's bringing the, the attention of the, the whole community about the protection of the ocean, and in particular, as I mentioned before, the ocean floor. Other important um, mm, connection with this is that all the preliminary information uh, use on preparing the file to be presented to the Peruvian authorities, uh, use uh, data presented by JEPCO and GMRT uh, data sets. Uh, this is a Peruvian, this one in the right side of the slide is the Peruvian uh, territory, and here in this uh, yellow box is the uh, this protected, uh, now protected uh, area. If we can see a slide view of the territory, we can like uh, imagine that this is the, this right here in the left side of the slide or the Andes, and then we have the Peru Chile trench, and uh, the protected area is oh, uh, it's the other side of the trench, uh, as you can see in this graph here. Um, we think this is uh, this 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 is a very important political decision. And I think it's the same in, in all countries that we, that with a official decision or official decision, uh, political decision, it's easier for the academia and researchers to uh, looking for resources to, to do more research in this, in, in any particular area. Um, with this uh, framework, we are uh, completing the planning to do or to carry out an expedition over this area with our uh, vessel, the Carrasco vessel. It is equipped with a multi beam echo sonder. In the meantime, let me share with you uh, this map or this uh, map, this area map with the pressure drop, uh, or recently map, I would say. This has been mapped in January or February this year, and just uh, this month we officially received the information of the data. We are still processing. Um, at this point, I even when he's not uh, in this meeting, I will uh, express uh, the gratitude of the of Peruvian people to Victor Vescovo, as, as you probably hear about him, is the owner of this uh, vessel, uh, to uh, the willingness to, to show this willingness to to share with us uh, important vessel time to carry out this vessel over uh, about 10,000 square kilometers. Uh, we, most of this data here is mostly new data for Peruvian researchers. So we are doing the analysis of this, uh, uh, of this information. We have some information about some of the, uh, the the sea in the uh, in the upper the, 
the simons you can see in the in the upper side of the slide uh we have information of some information about that simons but all the all other uh simons and features uh are mostly uh, new information to be analyzed uh by the peruvian academia and researchers there is a person uh in this meeting that I also want to express my gratitude. This I'm talking about Haya. Haya Roperes uh, helped us a lot with the planning of this uh, of this uh, mapping activity. Thank you very much, Haya, for your patience, planning over and over the uh, the mapping of this area. So uh, these are some of the detailed images. Of the area, as you can see, there is uh, there are in very very important features, uh, quite uh, with a very significant size. As you can see, the one in in the upper side, the one here. Not sure if you can see my uh, my cursor, my uh, my pointer, uh, but this is the one in the up right. Is about more than two kilometers high and over uh, 19 kilometers. Uh, long and you can see also the sizes of other features in this uh, area as you can see there are very very important areas and also some uh, probably the presence of some um, activity or volcanic activity uh, over this area which as i mentioned before is about uh, 50 miles away from the coast of uh, south america or peru well, this is mostly what I wanted to share with you. We also have some plans to map all our EEC within the next following four years. So we have important plans to continue with our mapping activities uh, aligned with the um, objective of JEPCO and CIBE 2030 project. Well, thank you. Thanks, Hugo. That was a really interesting talk. It was great to see that high resolution bathymetry there and that bathymetry has been helping um, guide where to protect the seafloor. Um, so it looks like you've got your hand raised, Kevin. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, gracias, Hugo. That was a, a great presentation. Um, I love those volcanoes. I'm really intrigued about what's happening with those lineation uh, volcanoes. But um, on, a, on a more broader um, scale, What's the domestic capability for Peru to map the seafloor? Do you have a fleet of vessels with multi beams? We have a fleet with multi beams, but just one deep, uh, uh, deep, deep sea or deep, uh, just one echo sonder with a uh, in one particular vessel, the one I show in the presentation, with just right. one one of these uh, echo sonders, and I think in total. In the hydrographic office, there are about six to seven uh, multi vehicle sonders, but mostly for shallow waters. And then we have this one to do for deep ocean uh, mapping. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Well done, by the way. Good presentation. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Hugo? Remember, you can um, use the raise hand feature or type your question into the chat. Um, looks like we don't have any more questions for you right now, Hugo, but if anyone does think of any others, you can type them into the chat and we might be able to come to them at the end of the session. So thanks very much, Hugo. That was a great talk. So we'll move on to our third talk of this session. That's from Nicholas Pion, the Hydrography Manager at the National Maritime Safety Authority. And he's going to talk about the status of seafloor mapping and bathymetry data coverage in Papua New Guinea. So um, over to you, Nicholas, if you're ready to start um, giving your presentation. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jenny, for um, allowing me to, to present here. Um, I also would like to thank the, the South and West Pacific uh, Regional Committee uh, community to uh, accept my, um, me to be able to present here. Um, um, so basically, uh, by way of an intro introduction, I am the manager hydrography within uh, the National Maritime Safety Authority. 
Um, so my presentation will be broadly what the activities are within PNG and um, may not necessarily cover some of the technical or, or, or work that we do, but uh, the projects basically what we, we have within PNG. Um, and I hope to learn uh, more about CBET 20, 2030 project uh, by being part of this um, uh, group. Um, That's great. Yeah, we can see that now. I press next. Oh, just this. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so you um, can you see my screen now? We can. Yes. Great work. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so I'll just go to the next slide. Um, so uh, this map basically shows where PNG is. Um, uh, so we are just north of Australia, setting the border with Australia, um, Indonesia, Solomon Islands, and, and the Federated States of Micronesia to, to the north. Um, so we are an uh, archipelagic state. Uh, we have 151 islands scattered over uh, an area of uh, three, about three million square kilometers. Um, so we lie, uh, PNG lies within the, uh, the South Pacific uh, region. Um, so uh, just some of the related uh, policies that are within government. Um, so we have the, uh, um, since 2007, we have a collaboration that started with, with the government agencies uh, and basically was to review the National CIS Act um, and part of that work was the introduction of the, the extended continental shelf uh, work that, that uh, uh, commenced uh, within the work of the maritime boundaries delimitation. Uh, and following that, we had an approved Maritime Zones Act uh, 2015 uh, with an NEC decision to uh, um, uh, to approve uh, what, to, what we call a national oceans policy. And, and within that uh, was the establishment of uh, the MSR committee uh, and the guidelines uh, um, uh, which were just launched uh, this year. Um, and within that oceans policy also is the provision for marine special planning. Um, we have another program which is called the PNG Marine Program. Um, and that is basically uh, implemented by the Conservation Environment and Protection Agency, uh, basically to manage MPAs and, and marine spatial planning is also part of that uh, work as well. Uh, I believe there are a few workshops on that um, with an advisory committee. Um, we have another region, regional mapping initiatives. Uh, a few, a few of those. Uh, one is the maritime boundaries delimitation and the extended continental shelf uh, mapping uh, project, and also uh, a coastal waters project. So I'm just going going back and forth within my organization and and what the other uh, projects uh, are doing. So as an IHO member. We are a full member of the IHO uh, and the South Pacific Hydrographic Commission. Uh, we have an existing bilateral arrangement with Australia as the principal charting authority. Uh, we have products in, uh, within uh, this arrangement. We have ENCs and paper charts covering PNG. Um, and uh, we just approved the uh, crowdsource bathymetry activities uh, for waters within the national jurisdiction uh, just this year uh, in relation to Secular 21. 2020, uh, just the IHO secular. Um, so by way of uh, stakeholder engagement, we hold uh, annual meetings every September um, with our stakeholders. Um, so that photo basically shows uh, the last one we have, I think about 2018 or 19 before COVID came in and uh, we were not able to uh, have those annual meetings. Uh, basically to identify survey priorities and 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 for for chatting especially uh, and one of the if, uh, we have the Australian hydrographic office also participating in in these annual meetings um, so this slide just basically shows uh, I think a few of the activities or data collection activities that we have uh, in the last two or three years uh, we've had a single beam survey just outside of Port Mosby. 
we have uh, also trialed uh, SDB survey by EOMAP in, in one of the two outer islands of PNG, um, that's Tao and Nukmanu Islands. Uh, and those islands uh, basically uh, generate uh, territorial sea baselines and were critical in terms of defining the, the EZ uh, 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 baselines. Um, and they, they actually lie outside the current chart scheme. So it was uh, a good opportunity to, to survey using uh, uh, SD, uh, SDB uh, because they are actually far off from the main group of islands that we have. Um, and we have uh, various multi-beam surveys that were done by FUGRO under the ATP program uh, and it started in 2018. Uh, we have also an uh, external content self project. Um, they basically three easiest projects that we have. Uh, the Ocean Tower Plateau being the, the, the one of the big one. Um, so this is a large, uh, the OJP, uh, the Ocean Tower Plateau is, is a large uh, submarine plateau, about 2 million kilometers, square kilometers, standing uh, 2 to 4,000 meters uh, above the uh, deep ocean floor. Uh, so that's the the the, uh, the image to the left. Uh, that's the one that is lying between PNG, FSM, and and Solomon Islands. Um, so we have the UN has approved this uh, submission uh, and recommended uh, that a bit more work needs to be done in terms of measuring those sea mounts uh, by multi beam. Uh, so that's an activity that we are. Uh, we, we are looking at uh, looking uh, to do more research and, and get funding for for more research in, in, in that area. Uh, definitely this thing needs to be done with, with the three three countries uh, working together in collaboration. So um, I, I believe this is an activity that could be uh, of interest uh, within this within this uh, this community. Um, we have also separate submissions uh, for two other areas. That's the Musa Ridge and, and the Europic Rise, um, which is towards the border with Indonesia. Uh, those are sub single submissions, um, uh, which uh, Indonesia and also FSM has also interest in those areas. Um, we have various data sets as well uh, held uh, by other agencies uh, some will be from the underwater cable surveys uh, the current one or the most recent one being the 7000 kilometer uh, telecom cable that was just laid a few years ago uh, we believe uh, that there is some data was co collected uh, uh, before uh, this uh, as part of uh, laying out these cables and that would be useful for for mapping as well. And there's also oil and gas pipeline surveys uh, that are um, uh, available. I think we need to uh, work to identify those and that could be useful information uh, for us and for the project as well. Uh, so just going back to, to the organization which I am in, um, we have a few related uh, capacity building activities. Um, and one is the uh, hydrographic awareness workshop we uh, we had uh, in May this year, and the purpose was to identify survey priorities and and establish MOU arrangements with with our stakeholders, and 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 I and two of those MOUs are in progress for um, uh, finalizing the agreements. Uh, we've had uh, MSDI group training uh, just towards the end of last year. Um, with uh, about 12 staff from uh, NMSA and uh, Department, of, Department of Transport, uh, and that training was delivered by IIC Technology. Uh, the purpose was just to raise awareness on just spatial data management uh, governance and, and basically help us to establish some kind of arrangement uh, in terms of data management. Upcoming mapping projects, we have uh, aerographic survey priorities, uh, which we are working on. Um, and that is basically to uh, just have a, a, a long term list of priorities uh, with contracts that we are able to 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 establish uh, and 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 have those planned for for the next five years. Um, that's within the organization that I'm working uh, with the uh, NMSA. Um, but with other projects, we have the three mile coastal waters mapping project, 
uh, of the Bougainville Islands. Um, we'll be using satellite uh, imagery. Um, with the, uh, this, this project is being done with uh, SPC. Um, and we have uh, uh, two awareness workshops as well planned for this year. Um, and, and most of uh, those workshops is just to raise the awareness of, of what we do in terms of hydrography. But I think I think to a large extent it will uh, relate to what, what this the JEPCO project is about, possibly in terms of um, getting to, to collect what is being uh, other data sets that have been collected by other agencies. Um, so we have an MOU arrangement that is in the process uh, of finalizing with UNITEC. Uh, so UNITEC, University of Technology is basically a, uh, has a surveying department that is, is, is training students in surveying and, 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 and cartography GIS. So we are uh, looking at establishing an arrangement for, for some assistance with, uh, with projects that we can fund for the university or, or, or engage students as internships in this, in, within our organization. Uh, so these are the the relevant agencies that are involved in 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 mapping activities uh, within uh, PNG. We have the Foreign Affairs Justice Department, uh, Fisheries, uh, Mineral Policy, and Geohazards. That's for the External Continental Shelf Project, uh, Mineral Resources, uh, NMSA, uh, the Conservation Environment uh, Protection Agency, uh, and the universities. And uh, some uh, most uh, the gaps and challenges we have uh, data is scattered across all different agencies. Uh, this lack of uh, technical capacity standards and also uh, uh, infrastructure to collect data. Um, These institutional and financial arrangements uh, to support ocean mapping um, and this uh, lack of awareness and the importance of uh, ocean mapping and and uh, and other related projects. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I would like to say that I'm, um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be, to be part of this, uh, this meeting and to learn. I've just learned a lot from just being uh, involved in this meeting for the, for the first time yesterday. And, and I think um, we, we, have, we can learn from, from this project and be able to contribute in whatever way we can for our area. Um, and hopefully we can raise awareness and cooperate with uh, other stakeholders, uh, especially within within uh, PNG. Uh, and that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. That was a really interesting talk, and I'm glad that you were learning a lot from us as well as us learning from you. Um, I thought it was really um, good reminder there that bathymetry data is not just being collected for science objectives or navigation or unclassed, but also you talked about the surveys for the underwater cables and oil and gas pipelines. So that was a good reminder to all of us, I think. Um, I see, we've, Kevin, you've got your hand up. Do you want to go ahead with your question? Yeah, so just just uh, uh, acknowledgement. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I found it very informative. Um, and I really would like to work closely with you um, and, and, and working with the PNG government if that's possible, we can maybe um, reach out and have some further communications. Um, I do have a question about the uh, UNCLOS submission. As I understand it, the joint submission has been already um, looked at by the subcommission, but Eurific Rise and Massa Ridge have not been looked at. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, they have they have not been looked at. Uh, I think basically because we we just provided a, a preliminary information uh, and not an actual submission. Okay. Do you know what the plans are for submission times for those parts of the seafloor? Um, uh, at the moment, uh, I, I'm um, there. I'm not aware of of any plans available, uh, and 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 one of the reason being. Uh, the lead uh, geologist uh, that was uh, 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 working on this project has retired, and, and and that's something that uh, we need to uh, uh, to get some replacement uh, arrangement for that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Does anyone else have any um, questions for Nicholas? OK, in that case, um, thank you again. That was a really interesting talk. And we'll move on to the next one, which is Erin Heffron, who is an, an ocean mapper and GIS analysis 
analyst, sorry, from the Ocean Exploration Trust. Erin's going to talk about the Nautilus Pacific mapping operations for the last year. So um, over to you, Erin. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and share. All right. And all right. Hopefully you can see me OK and hear me OK. Um, yes, so yes, yeah. good. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about our mapping on the Nautilus, um, both 2021 and 2022. But then I kind of wanted to talk about some bigger picture things, um, and that's really the more the focus of my talk. Um, why is it such a hard question to answer? Um, if you're not familiar with the Nautilus, uh, let me get that out of the way. Um, if you're not familiar with the Nautilus, uh, we are the Ocean Exploration Trust is exploration of the oceans um, via the exploration vessel Nautilus um, with uh, goals of doing ocean exploration, but also inspiring the next generation of explorers. So we have a really strong STEM education program, uh, interns from all over the place, um, and scientists ashore who support us um, from ashore and, and add commentary and, and support our ongoing expert efforts uh, through telepresence. If you're also not familiar, so kind of our main gig is mapping and ROV work. Uh, so we have a Cosberg EM302, 30 kilohertz system, uh, Nudson 3.5 and 15 kilohertz. Um, ROV Hercules can do up to 4,000 meters, supported by Argus. And we have ROV Little Hercules that could do 6,000 meters, uh, commonly supported by Ad Atlanta. We also, um, through our partnership with the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, have guest vessels, um, including these uncrewed systems. We just did a tech demo with the NUI, um, which is Huey's undersea vessel and Mesobot. But on the mapping side, um, we have just started using DRIX this year, which is um, UNH has that asset. Um, and that has an EM24 currently, and we'll have an EM710 um, to allow us to do additional uncrewed mapping um, and in conjunction with Nautilus mapping, uh, hopefully concurrently. Uh, there will be more Drix mapping coming soon on NA143, which is the next expedition, if you're interested in seeing that happening. Uh, we also do some really high res mapping. We have a Norbit system that's a shared resource uh, we can mount on ROV Hercules. Uh, that's quite cool. And this is a image that Chris Krasnowski made. Uh, he did some interface work for the high res mapping um, on the last cruise, and they're actually currently doing it now. And if you tune into Nautilus Live, they might still be doing high res mapping. So shout out to that team. Um, I just wanted to bring the, up our priorities. Um, these are our priorities as as an organization. I just wanted to point out that Steve 2030 is on there. So in addition to supporting NOAA as our primary sponsor um, and supporting mapping around the US EEZ, we are very much dedicated to mapping in international waters as well and making all of that data available and um, contributing to the CBED 2030 grid. And just an overview of the two seasons that I'm going to I'm briefly talking about um, 2021. Um, almost everything was in the Pacific, with the exception of Thunder Bay. We did some work out in the National Marine Sanctuary there, um, but otherwise in the Pacific, uh, out of our home port of San Pedro, and the highlighted cruises had major mapping components. And now the 2022 season, and also to point out there are sponsor logos on there. Um, most of our work is sponsored by NOAA Ocean Exploration um, through the NOAA Ocean or through the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, uh, which we are part of. And for the 2022 season, um, we're strictly in the, the Pacific near the and around the Hawaiian Islands and the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument um, and Papahana Lokulakea Marine National Monument. So we've been working out in that area uh, so far this year. And so what that's looked like in real life, um, the blue boxes are kind of just an overview map of what we mapped in 2021. Um, not great, uh, but it is a really big area. And orange is what we've mapped so far in 2022. And the, the little compass is our home port in San Pedro. We left that last uh, summer, uh, came to Honolulu on that long transit, and then have been mapping around uh, the Hawaiian Islands and in the Central Pacific since then. Um, we stayed in Honolulu over our, our short winter break, and we'll be doing the same uh, this winter. So really focusing our efforts uh, in the more remote regions of the Pacific. 
then that's what it looks like. Uh, the, the colors are the overlays of the regional data, data centers received by 2030. So you can see we're kind of split between um, the North Atlantic, uh, East Pacific, uh, uh, seabed regional data center and the West Pacific. But actually most of the, the kind of the big chunks of data are in the West Pacific. So you guys got the most of our data. Um, and also to be clear, we do immediately contribute all this data. Uh, we send it in, um, have it processed through R2R, uh, it goes into GMRT, onto NCEI, and into JEPCO and ZBO 2030. So, so far uh, for 2021, we had over 105,000 square kilometers. Um, 2022, so far, a little less than 100,000, but growing by the day. And uh, just to be clear, these stats are pretty good, but when we get into the rest of my presentation, that's some like stats that I just did as this kind of preliminary analysis. So if you are a NOAA boss and you heard different, you should listen to the bosses um, from OT. These are just kind of my, my preliminary stats, but these are, these are pretty solid here. Uh, but we're still going. Uh, if you go to nautiluslive.org right now, we're on NA141 and we're actually exploring um, with the RVs around Jalsam Atoll and also doing some mapping uh, when the weather's not cooperating. And we have, again, the, the Drix crews coming up, um, the dual technology crews, which will be uh, up around the Northwest Hawaiian Islands in Papahanaumokuakea, and then another cruise dedicated to Papahanaumokuakea. These are just some really pretty highlights um, of some mapping over the last two years. Uh, just uh, most of the images I made, except for the one on the top right, that was Haley Drennan, who uh, works with GMRT and CBED 2030, so you might know that name. And then kind of on to what I want to talk a little bit more about um, is this question of what was mapped. So as we're getting ready for these giant expeditions across the Pacific and to do our, um, our mapping, we are trying to figure out what is already mapped. And we know that Jebco is aiming to provide that and is doing a great job and it's getting better every year. But depending on what time of year you're looking um, or where in the world you are, the Jebco map is not going to have everything. Uh, maybe there's a more updated resource that's available for your region. Maybe you're in a region where people are not comfortable contributing yet. We're still working on that. Um, or Maybe uh, it was judged not good enough data. You know, there's so many different reasons why you may not have the data in the Jebco map. So I can't just, as a, a planner, and I have my images on the right of this, as a planner, I can't just look at the Jebco map when I'm thinking about where we should go to our mapping. I have to look at several different resources. I look at the Jebco map. I look at the NOAA Bathy Gap Analysis, with NOAA being our primary sponsor. Um, I look at GMRT, um, whatever, since with these I can within reason because we don't have all day. And on the left, this was an example from Vicki Farini um, talking about the kind of work she has to do to help people in different regions. And this is for the Mesoamerican Caribbean uh, Hydrographic Commission, helping them figure out what's been mapped in their area and the kind of overviews that they're looking at, trying to figure out and explain to people uh, why they should sponsor mapping. And this is just really difficult, really hard to do. And I am I know quite a lot about mapping, but this is still challenging for me. And to do at sea with uh, web services and things, is it's quite difficult. And just based on that, if we partly, if we are only partly know what has been mapped, how can we say what is newly mapped? I always see um, numbers put out, and I get that Jebco is trying their best to come up with that number, and I get it. But when I hear different groups say, "Oh, we mapped this much new seafloor," I wonder what they're comparing it to. Um, it's really makes a challenge to, to reporting what you're contributing. Um, so I did just a quick case study on the last expedition um, to kind of get a feel for what that looked like. And I looked at uh, Johnson Atoll, which is where we were mapping, and it was a really nice one to do because it's such a tidy little um, EEZ and also the Pacific Remote Islands National Marine Monument, the atoll is the entire EEZ. So nice, nice, tidy little polygon. Um, you can see the gray scale is our transit and other mapping expeditions, and then the colored is what was within the atoll. And if you can see the red stars, they were our uh, proposed dive sites. So we were focusing on trying to get some coverage on the, the southern dive sites for areas that weren't covered. So just looking at what was previously mapped, I looked at just four sources. There are many, um, but I looked at NCI, GMRT, um, JEBCO 2021. Um, so you guys are probably all familiar with those. And then a fourth um, 
synthesis that is great for us in the uh, in the Pacific around Hawaii and Johnson is John Smith's regional synthesis. Um, John was at the University of Hawaii for a very long time, and he maintains a synthesis that um, he makes available to us and others, and it's it's really good. Um, so that's the one on the bottom right, uh, but it's really he's clipped it to be around Johnson, so that's why it looks like there's only data right there. Um, but just visually, you can see that each one of these is quite different, and on the right. I have um, the different square kilometers for each of these. Um, also things to take into account, the difference in grid resolution, right? So my analysis can only be so correct because our data is, you know, maybe let's say 50 to 150 meters gridded resolution. We're getting these data sources down at varying resolutions um, from 60 meters for John synthesis, which is less likely to overestimate coverage um, to 400 meters. Um, and for the really deep parts of the ocean, that's great. But for other areas, um, that may not be such a good uh, coverage estimate. When we overlap all of them, even the most complete syntheses were missing data that were found in others. So no single one contained everything. Uh, but based on these four sources, if I combine them all together, um, they say about 167 thousand square kilometers or about 38 percent of the monument had been mapped to the to the best of our knowledge based on those four. All right, so then how much should we map? So this is zooming in on what we mapped um, in that area. The black kind of uh, checker box is the existing data there based on the four combined sources and rough estimate um, about 27,000 ish square kilometers. Um, some areas we know we're going to overlap. We always purposefully map right along the edge of existing data to make a better C4 model. Uh, typically, we aim for 100% overlap with our own data, depending on how much time we have and conditions. So we're going to lose coverage there. And of course, we cross existing data. So we know we're going to lose some coverage there. But comparing it to the four options, uh, how did it play out? So these are our two visual examples, but on the right you get the square kilometers. So 21,000 to 22,000-ish square kilometers, depending on who you ask. And having looked at this in a lot of different parts of, the, of where we work, these are really close numbers. Um, I, because we're in the southern part of the monument where most of the existing data tended to be focused, um, and because of where we were in the world, it, they happen to work out to be pretty close. But I have done analysis like this visually more likely that things were very, very, very different. Uh, but based on all four sources combined, um, which I had to combine them myself, so they aren't pre-existing combined, uh, we added about 21,290 square kilometers. Um, so we mapped about seven and a half to eight percent of the part of Johnson Atoll that was unmapped. So what would help with this? Um, what we have proposed uh, as part of TSCOM, um, that's the Technical Subcommittee on Ocean Mapping, which is a JEBCO subcommittee, um, our opportunistic mapping resources working group um, proposed an investigation proofs of concept. And um, with talking, talking to the Global Center, realize this was one of their high priorities. So we had discussions with them and we have a kind of a little investigation and proof of concept that's ongoing, almost complete, uh, finding it to be not so super easy to do this. But I think personally that this would really help um, both me as somebody trying to do reporting and planning um, and possibly others who are just at the proposal stage trying to get support from different organizations to do seabed mapping. I'm also interested here if anybody has any other suggestions. And then just to close up, I wanted to shout out to all the ocean mappers. Um, I, I did the little bit of analysis here, but obviously I did not collect all that data myself. We have a really huge team of seafloor mapping interns, uh, professional ocean mappers, navigators, dash mappers, um, et cetera, who, who come out on the ship and they have been great to work with. And again, I just want uh, to plug the NA141 team who are out there right now currently exploring um, possibly on some data that we mapped, though they've been doing some additional mapping themselves, and you can check them out on Nautilus Live. And that is all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. That was a, another really interesting talk and really encouraging to see just how much of the seabed you've been mapping, even taking into account the uncertainties or <laughs> the complications of what's already been mapped and the lack of a complete definitive source for that. That's an encouraging amount of new seafloor and some beautiful data there. So thank you for sharing that. 
And um, I think Haya's going to add a poll, another poll, so people um, should see that shortly and take the time to answer that. That would be great. And let's see, do we have any questions? Um, Haya's um, just put a link into the chat saying there's the um, SORPAC web map app that can help with planning for the South and West Pacific region. And she says, please note the centre's compiling year round, so new data sets that are yet to be compiled for the next Jebco grid are not in the web map yet. Um, but do contact um, Hire or Kevin at the centre to help with planning. I'd encourage anyone to do that, particularly people who don't have the resources to be compiling all these different data sets together. There's so many gaps, we don't want to be <laughs> recollecting data we've already got just because we haven't gone through that really um, laborious process that you've gone through of compiling all the data sets. So, good. Um, does anyone have any questions they want to type in or raise their hands to ask? OK, um, we'll move on to the next talk. I'll just thank you again, Erin, for a really um, interesting and thought provoking talk. Thank you. Um, so our final um, speaker for this session is Eric King. Eric is the Senior Director of Operations at the Schmidt Ocean Institute and Eric's going to talk about gap filling the Pacific and induce, introducing the RV Falker. Um, if you want to go ahead and do your presentation, Eric, thank you. Good, thank you very much. Let me get my presentation up here. Okay, can you see it? Um, so far we can just see a black screen. We can see you're sharing okay. something, but I'm not seeing that. Yeah, we've got it now. That's great. Thank okay, you. Okay, terrific. Thank you. All right, well, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present here and actually it was fantastic uh, listening to Aaron's presentation because uh, we we have some very similarities between our organizations. We are uh, partners for many years. We collaborated on a variety of um, um, expedition and outreach and, and educational activities, but certainly in the, in the mapping context, it's very important because we are uh, definitely uh, seeing some of the uh, the same issues that uh, that she and her organization sees when it comes to trying to identify uh, what really needs to be mapped, and so we don't map over existing bathymetry areas. Uh, but for us, in the focus of uh, my brief talk here, it's uh, the first half or the first portion is uh, about the final expedition or the final cruise that, that we're doing or we did do with our ship called the Falcor. And that was um, uh, in the in this particular uh, South and West Pacific region that we're focused on for this this meeting. And uh, this cruise, uh, we, you know, we give our cruises numbers as well, the FK 210605, and that was uh, between June and July of, of last year, where we had uh, our research vessel, Falcor. And for those that are not familiar with our organization, Schmidt Ocean Institute, uh, we operate one vessel and uh, we are philanthropically funded. Um, our sponsor um, is a, a husband and wife, uh, Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Uh, they've been funding us uh, this particular program uh, since 2010 and we have spent um, a majority of our 2019 and 2020 and uh, uh, half of 2021 um, in the South Pacific and um, over a year, about a year and a half going around Australia uh, when the pandemic hit and we had a, a pivot in our operations. But we work with a variety of scientists globally and in this particular uh, case, uh, this particular cruise that I'm just briefly mentioning here, uh, this was predominantly a U.S. scientist um, working in, um, in one region uh, a little bit further south than uh, perhaps Nautilus is uh, working now uh, with the Ocean Exploration Trust. And this is in the Phoenix Islands archipelago and also um, an area around and to the south of the archipelago called the, uh, well, what we're referring to as the areas beyond national uh, jurisdiction. And the, the Phoenix Islands area, um, and we're really focused this again on the, kind of the, the last Pacific uh, mapping uh, expedition that we did uh, with this 
with our research vessel Falcor. Um, around the Phoenix Islands in the U.S. waters, that's the Howland and Baker unit of the Pacific Remote Islands Mar Marine National Monument. And this other area, uh, which is also very important to us, uh, we're not exclusively working in EEZs, um, the A, B, and Js, and that's the part of the ocean where uh, there's no one country controls. Um, and for us, our interest and the scientists' interest that we were collaborating with was on now uh, looking at unexplored uh, seamounts and investigating the biodiversity of the high seas. So uh, some of these specific areas, and I just highlighted um, again briefly with some screenshots here, um, of what we were doing. Now, this was not just a mapping, and that's kind of, I think, the, the beauty of uh, our organization or the benefit that we contribute is this gap filling. So we're not exclusively mapping. We're not a hydrographic organization. Um, we are interested in the seafloor, the subsea floor, the water column of the atmosphere above the water, uh, testing robotic systems, and really trying to enable scientists and engineers and technologists um, have an opportunity to go to sea that may not have otherwise had a chance to go to sea or to test out some hypotheses. As a benefit of this, the mapping is certainly very important and, and very critical and a key part of what we do, but it's not the only thing that we do. And this particular cruise, again, what was very exciting is that uh, the mapping went hand in hand with uh, some of this other work about looking at these uh, deep sea microbes and also understanding, you know, how the microbes interact with uh, with uh, coral systems, and these coral fields, and also looking at uh, uh, how these the seamounts may play uh, a factor in in what happens within those those microbe colonies. So here we have uh, an area, and uh, taking a um, a bit from from Aaron, you know, we talk about what did we map, and this particular uh, cruise, again, our last one in the Pacific with this particular ship, uh, that was around uh, 44,745 square kilometers. But in addition to the mapping, we also have a, a remotely operated vehicle on our ship that uh, we built, and uh, with that ROV and with these scientists over about a month time, we took uh, 600 samples from around these seamounts and from these areas, and these, corals, these coral fields uh, during 21 different dives with our, our ROV. So uh, as I had mentioned in where the, uh, the, the second half of uh, my brief talk is gonna go, uh, this ship that I've been referring to, the Falcor, uh, uh, is, uh, has been with us again since uh, uh, going to see 2012. And since we've had this uh, ship, uh, we've mapped uh, about 1.3 and a half uh, million square kilometers of the seafloor. That's between the Atlantic Ocean, and the Caribbean, and the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean, including the Tasman Sea, the Timor Sea. So quite, of a, quite an expansive area. And just last year alone, in 2021, uh, there are 119,000 square kilometers that we mapped. Now, how many of those square kilometers that we mapped uh, perhaps have been mapped by others that we just didn't know about? That's a great question. And again, I think that you know uh, Aaron's comments are are very important because um, if we find ourselves in a transit or we want to uh, look at a specific area, uh, perhaps we might uh, adjust um, where. Uh, we might have a swath path so that we're not covering over uh, existing data. So what did we do with our ship Falcor since we had it in operation? We did 81 cruises um, over its uh, uh, roughly 10 year life with us. Uh, we hosted over a thousand scientists, um, nearly uh, 1,900 days at sea with the ship uh, for science. And with our, our ROV, uh, that was uh, 590 dives and um, over 6,000 samples that, that we collected with the vehicle. And that's all in collaboration with scientists uh, from all over the world. Again, we're, uh, we work with scientists from Oceania, North America, Central South America, uh, Europe, um, the Far East. Um, it's really been uh, quite a joyous uh, nine, 10 years with this ship. Uh, and we were, uh, a little sad to see it go, uh, but 
um, our founders, uh, the Eric and Wendy Schmidt uh, couple that um, fund our program and fund all of our, all of our activities. Um, they wanted to increase the capacity of what we're able to offer the global scientific community and uh, add some some additional resources uh, beyond what we could provide with our ship Falcor. So uh, last year uh, it was decided that we were going to donate our ship uh, Falcor, which uh, had an EM304 and an EM712 that we could uh, map the shallower waters. Uh, we donated that to uh, uh, the Italian research organization CNR and they're going to uh, use it for um, ex exploration and discovery work and education in the Mediterranean and in its place um, we purchased uh, another vessel so we like to reuse vessels um, so we purchased another vessel it was about uh, 11 years young and it uh, was built primarily for the offshore oil and gas uh, energy sector and uh, we're putting a, a new life on it. So we've taken it from um, a light duty offshore a subsea construction vessel and we're converting it into um, an oceanographic platform. With the mission primarily being very much the same as Falcor, um, sailing it globally um, around the world, focusing on region by region and hosting uh, scientists again from, from all across the globe but this ship did not have any uh, bathymetry capability. Um, it didn't have any sonars in the bottom of the hull. And of course, uh, we think that's uh, quite important. It's part of our mission. It's a core value of what we do to, um, to help explore and characterize the, the seafloor and the water column and the, and the subsea floor. So um, we did need to add a system. I'm gonna just mention that here in a minute. But currently uh, our ship, this new vessel that we have, uh, it's in Spain, that's where I am right now, and we're uh, going through our conversion. And we hope by the end of this year uh, that we'll be sailing the ship um, on our sea trials and we'll begin science um, at, the, at the very end of, of 2022. It's a big vessel, it's quite a bit larger than what we uh, currently have. Uh, this ship measures um, almost 111 meters. It's quite a, uh, a platform. Um, again, as I mentioned, it, it spent uh, half of its life in the Gulf of Mexico and, and the other half of its 11-year uh, life in the North Sea. Uh, and now, at the last uh, a year, we've had it here in Spain um, undergoing this refit. Now, something this large certainly uh, poses some additional challenges if we're also interested in working in, in very uh, near shore waters, uh, shallower waters, but that didn't stop us from uh, putting some shallow water bathymetry systems on it. And, uh, and those shallow water bathymetry systems, um, as well as the deep water, are going into a, a gondola. Actually, we've already gone into it. Uh, we're, we're done here. These pictures are a few months old, but uh, we've built what's probably one of the largest gondolas in the world. It's uh, 19 meters in length. And inside this gondola, you know, we have quite an array of, of, of scientific echo sounders and fishery sonars and multi-beam echo sounders. Uh, but this is a steel structure. It weighs over 32 tons and we have 11 tons of sonars inside here. So it's uh, quite a structure uh, that we had fabricated and, and ultimately attached to the bottom of the ship. And this is just a, uh, a profile view of, of the bathymetry system or the the gondola's position under the vessel and we anticipate fairly good results. Uh, we'll, we will be working with the, the U.S. organization, the Multi-Beam Advisory Committee, to help us set the system up. But for those of you uh, on this call that uh, that like the numbers, uh, we'll be publishing here shortly um, everything that we have in, inside the, the gondola and we're displaying it and we'll share it in a couple of different ways. One from the technical perspective that um, talks about the, the manufacturer make and the models and their frequencies. Uh, but this is a system uh, as a gondola in its entirety, um, a scientific suite of, of echo sounders and sonars that'll take us from just a few meters under the keel um, all the way down to the full ocean depth um, and then even a couple of hundred meters in, into the seafloor. Now the largest sonar arrays that, uh, that Kongsberg builds for the multi-beam and also for the sub-bottom profiling, um, it's really going to be uh, quite a, a, an impressive kit of, 
of sonar is that um, we certainly hope that our, our scientific community and our collaborators will, will be taking advantage of. And then this is just another uh, image. It, it's too fine of detail to read on the screen here, but uh, instead of just giving uh, the, the make and models, we're describing what each of the systems does um, about uh, current monitoring, sediment profiling, uh, fish finding, listening with the hydrophones, uh, determining depths, and of course, uh, seafloor mapping. Uh, but it took us quite a while and just focusing on this particular piece of equipment that's on the ship because it, it for those of us that operate ships, um, adding a structure like this uh, and being involved in it, you really get an appreciation for the amount of effort and the work that, that it takes to, to install such a massive structure uh, with these sonars. And it doesn't uh, happen without the, the good works and the help of, of uh, the people of the Kongsberg and, and from the Teledynes of the world, um, and of course, uh, naval architects and, and ship's crew and shipyard crew all working together to, to try to make the, the best product possible for, for the seafloor mapping. And these are just a couple of images before we, with our glossy finish, uh, be, before we flooded the dry dock a couple of weeks ago. And of course, we uh, we have camera systems, uh, underwater camera systems that are installed um, in various parts of the ship. And here you can see in, in the lower right uh, one particular camera system um, in the front part, the hammerhead of the um, of the gondola. So what else is this ship going to offer to the, to the science community? As I mentioned, we're not just um, about uh, um, hydrography or uh, us mapping the seafloor, we also want to offer some other unique assets. So in addition to the uh, the full ocean depth capability uh, for the water column and the subsea floor, and uh, as well as the, the mapping I mentioned, some, some new um, advanced systems in the sense of uh, increased capacity and capability at sea, uh, a massive amount of uh, open deck space for scientists to bring um, equipment, robotic systems, portable laboratories, additional accommodation modules, temporary living modules, um, a, a crane, a subsea construction crane um, that uh, we're hoping to be able to put to good use for the science community. And then moon pools. So the ship has a, ver a variety of moon pools for uh, working scientific gear and equipment um, through the middle of the ship and over the side. Uh, we have internal launch and recovery systems for uh, remotely operated vehicles and other robotic equipment. And then uh, it's station keeping. It has a unique propulsion system that uh, will help allow us to get very close uh, into those coral reef areas that perhaps are not mapped so well with uh, precision if we want to be able to um, do some edge mapping um, um, as well as uh, some precision station keeping with the remotely operated vehicles. And there's heli decks for, for um, aerial vehicles, and we have a whole suite of laboratories that are being installed. Uh, we have nine laboratories in all that are, are going into the ship. A-frame for handling more gear and equipment off the stern of the ship. And then uh, finally, um, where are we gonna go? Our first, uh, our first year of expedition, I know that was um, an element of of interest for uh, this particular uh, meeting. Uh, we'll be in the Atlantic for a little bit, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, and then we'll uh, spend a little bit of time in the in the Caribbean, but then uh, we'll move through the Panama Canal and work off the west coast of Central America, um, the Dorado outcrop and uh, the sea mounts off of Costa Rica, uh, the East Pacific rise uh, area, uh, and then it's quite a bit of time around Galapagos Islands. And actually, finally, uh, down off of uh, uh, Peru and, and Chile, uh, where we were looking at some Im images before from Hugo when he was talking about an area, marine protected area. Uh, there's a series of 10 seamounts um, along the uh, Juan Fernandez ridges that uh, we have some interest in, in working with scientists uh, from Europe uh, to characterize and study those those seamounts and do some additional mapping. So thank you, I appreciate it. And I'll, the parting shot is this glass octopus that uh, we were able to film outside the first time. I'm in high resolution. Um, uh, we actually found two of these uh, in the midwater column and these glass octopuses um, haven't been seen outside of marine protected areas. So there's hope. 
So in addition to uh, seafloor mapping, we're also helping to bring some uh, some images from um, the midwater area. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Another interesting talk and a staggering amount of new seafloor that's been mapped um, by the Forecore over the last decade and hopefully lots more to come with the new ship. I see that we're running a little bit behind time and we've got a break coming up now, so I suggest that if you have questions, they type them into the chat and then maybe Eric, you can type your answers um, into the chat either during the break or into the next session. Um, the poll is live, so if you've not answered it yet, please do so. I see, which is reassuring to see most people do plan to download the new Jebco grid and hopefully those that put notes because someone else in the Institute is and they will be getting the most up to date version. Um, but I think, yeah, we'll wrap up this session now. I'd like to thank again the five speakers. They were all really interesting talks. I certainly enjoyed all of them. So thank you to all of you. And if everyone wants to have a break now, grab a tea, coffee, whatever, and we'll be back at um, half past the hour, which is um, 1.30 in our time zone in New Zealand. But yeah, if you come back in about six minutes. Thanks very much. So kia ora everybody and welcome back. Um, it's about half past on the clock at the moment, but you've been able to grab a cup of tea or a drink. Um, just in case you missed it, welcome back. And uh, we have uh, another five presentations before we close the day. And first up, we have uh, Sean William from the National, uh, he's the National Coordinator for Hydrography um, with the Ministry of Information, Communications, Transport and Tourism Development in Kiribati. And uh, he'll be giving us um, status of seafloor mapping uh, in Kiribati. Uh, Sean, if you're there, then um, please, please carry on and present. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Hello. Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you um, uh, for the opportunity to to present today in uh, this uh, in this forum. So I'll be presenting on the status of the seafloor mapping in Kiribati. Uh, it will be a brief presentation. Uh, we've had not. Uh, any um, activity, uh, hopefully by next year, uh, it will be a different story once we have the, the surveys um, um, that will be conducted in Kiribati. So moving on with the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick introduction. Uh, so Kiribati is made up of uh, three uh, island groups. Um, there, there are 33 islands in total. Uh, we cover um, a large area of, uh, uh, in terms of our uh, um, geography. So there, there's consists of three groups: the Gilbert, the Phoenix, and the Line Island groups. And we cover about 3.5 square kilometers of ocean. And in comparison to the to our, uh, the landmass, uh, uh, you know, a fraction of it, um, 811 square kilometers, is uh, is um, is land which um, from that, only 22 out of the 33 uh, uh, islands are, uh, 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 are habited. Um, our population is just over um, 100,000 um, people. And, and so well, one of the major issues and challenges for us is the, is the distances between the islands, and um, especially with the you know, uh, safety uh, concerns of, of traveling between islands and understanding um, C4 mapping is a is a real and um, underlying um, importance to us in terms of understanding um, 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 shoals and um, sea mounts, and especially dangers to navigation in the shallow areas. Um, next slide, please. So, in terms of some of the existing data that's that's with us for the uh, for, for seabed uh, that we have. We have already those that exist with SBC, which, uh, which this we have provided to the seabed uh, 2030. Um, so far, from what we've uh, gathered, um, uh, we have there's data for four islands, and 
There is about that covers about 512 um, square kilometers. And so in the. Um, from the survey uh, from the SBC um, um, repository data that we gathered, um, this is the, 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 the data that we have mainly it's for the Gilbert group, um, Gilbert Islands. And so, so in the blue, the blue one that's um, on the far left, um, on the, the blue data, that's the that's um, direct measurement data that were incorporated into JEPCO 2022 compilation. And then the, the one that the colored um, um, towards the, the right, um, the red, the red to blue coverage, those are the key best data sets uh, in QSMS. We also um, have with us um, SDB data, um, which covers all of the 33 islands um, in the in, in Kiribati. So and this was obtained through the through um, um, collaboration with UK Cho through the um, EM. Forgot the name. Uh, my apologies. Uh, it was a program um, involving the blue blue economies. Um, um, program where we um, we managed to secure um, the funding to obtain uh, the islands through the assistance of UK Choke. Uh, next slide, please. And just just looking into um, into the data that uh, currently exists in comparison that we have in comparison with the JEPCO uh, 22, 22 grid. So the picture on the on the top there, the the, the survey data is the one that's um, that's in the that's in the the the, um, the colored scheme. Um, the in the the shaded profile from green to, to from green to um, to red, blue to red, it shows the shallow areas in Tarawa and the and the dark areas is of course the the mesh the mesh grid um, from the the 2022 uh, JEPCO uh, 2022 grid. And so just a quick comparison, um, thanks to uh, Aya for, for providing this. Um, just a quick comparison, um, hopefully it shows the, um, at the bottom, the profile, just looking at um, a profile there, um, the, the green on the top uh, shows the, 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 data, the survey data with the black, um, with the current um, JEPCO um, grid. Um, there is, um, you know, as expected, a uh, significant uh, difference um, in the in the measurements that's available uh, for the JEPCO grid, and so I, I believe that for this uh, the the, uh, the SRTM was used to fill in the gaps for this uh, for 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 the for the data for this um, uh, um, this area. So this just um, this is something that is really important for us to stress to especially those that. Uh, our our leaders and um, decision makers on the importance of having um, data that is measured, especially survey data, and it's something that we, we you know we strive to to embark on in the in the near future. Next next slide, please. And so, with the with the the plan surveys that we have in place now, is to is to. Uh, Survey uh, four islands um, in the Gilbert Group. Um, is uh, this the four islands um, surveys that will be involved in this will be both for LIDAR and um, MBES um, surveys. And uh, this project is supported by uh, by ADB and World Bank under the name of the Kiribati Island Transport Infrastructure Investment Project. Uh, also, we're engaging new KHO as a consultant and providing technical expertise in this area. So there was, those are some of the information regarding the areas that will be covered in terms of LIDAR and MBES surveys. And so uh, in comparison to what's already been presented in terms of areas covered, um, it's, it's a small, it's quite a small um, contribution, but I guess uh, a small contribution also goes a long way. And so one of the driving forces behind um, the need for this is, of course, to update our nautical charts, which which was you know, developed quite uh, uh, you know, like almost 50 years back. And some of them, uh, there's, a, there's a real need to update this information, especially as you know, with, with hazards that ha haven't been identified 
um, you know, in order to improve safety to navigation. And another aspect of um, uh, requiring this data is for infrastructure development. There's now plans, uh, government, um, to improve infrastructure on the other islands um, with um, with roads, new roads, and um, um, uh, wharfs, and um, um, get these. So there is a real need for for information, you know, to in order to start with the the the, the development uh, projects, especially as you know, larger ships will be needed to come in to transport um, aggregates and uh, equipment and and as cargo as, as and, and also people. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And so some of uh, what we're planning um, to do um, in the future is to is to continue to provide uh, data to the CBET 2030, um, uh, as well as um, start uh, looking at building capacity in country. As country, there's not very many people that are in this in the area of um, seabed mapping, so um, that is something we'd like to to do. Um, encourage um, um, you know the the younger generation to be involved. Uh, the institutional strengthening um, through the through the through learning from the project that we're currently embarking on, in the hopes that we'll be able to um, carry out the, the surveys uh, ourselves and be able to to to. Um, to to survey the rest of the islands where there is a need for improving improvement um, in charts or for safety for, for navigation and other um, development projects. Um, now for now, the what we are working on is um, we're engaging um, 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 firms from um, from overseas to help us with the with the surveys and currently it's still in the bidding stages of who, who that might be. So hopefully next year. Um, We'll be starting from the end of uh, end of this year. Towards next year, we'll have um, uh, somebody, um, company coming to work with us to map um, the four islands and hopefully build capacity from there. Um, also, we uh, are looking at having an IGF workshop, uh, data management in the coming months, especially in September. Uh, this is to further um, enhance understanding of how data is shared and how it is handled within government. Currently, there's no standards of how data is stored um, or, you know, the pr pr procedures in which it will be shared or, or even accessed. So I think, um, you know, investing in, a, in, in this is really important, especially if we wish to for our data to have a, um, the, 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 you know, if we want our data to be used over over several, um, um, you know, purposes, uh, rather than being kept in, you know, in a in somebody's um, a laptop or in a hard drive, it's something that we also wish to share and be able to, to for the public uh, to to have access to. And then uh, looking at um, crowdsourced bathymetry, that is something that we are really interested in. Um, we've not had. Uh, we, we've not made any sort of connections with those involved in this as yet, but it's something we would really look, uh, we would want to be involved in. So um, our our hands are up for this activity as well in the, in the near future. Next slide, please. That's fine. I'm, I'm just on. I'll just I'll just uh, talk through just my last two slides. Um, so, yeah, so some of the challenges that we currently have in general in terms of mapping um, is our lack of understanding of the geodetic datums that, uh, that exist. Uh, all, the, all the islands are on different um, geodetic datums, and there's a really need for us to modernize our, our datum so that we are on the, you know, um, we strive to be on the ITRF um, reference frames. So. Uh, that is one challenge for us. Another one is, of course, is the lack of awareness um, and importance of hydrography in the, in the in, in general. 
So this is something we hope to achieve through the um, through one of the workshops that we're planning to have as part of the the data management uh, and IGIF uh, workshop that we're planning to have in in September. We will uh, gather um, stakeholders and you know start the discussions around this. Uh, again, and also the lack of capacity, as as mentioned, I think there needs to be more interest in this area um, in order to. Uh, the, the, there is a real need for people to be engaged and uh, to, as you know, there's a large area to cover in terms of mapping and as well as data management. Like I mentioned before, the policies on data sharing, um, access, um, and even the, the, the infrastructure, uh, that is something will be, something is a real challenge uh, for us here. Next slide, please. Oh, and that's the, that's my presentation and thank you again for, for your time. Thank you, Sean, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, some uh, interesting points there, and I would think I confident can say that certainly the Kildabas is making some uh, real big contributions to the region um, in the data that they're sharing with CIPA 2030, but also some of the plans that are, they're looking ahead in terms of data sharing and the IGIF and um, holding workshops to build those that capacity. Uh, if anybody has any questions, um, maybe put them into the chat and um, maybe we can ask Sean to, to respond to those. Uh, so what we'll do now, maybe just to move on, uh, if we can go to uh, Nigel Townsend, uh, who will be giving us an update from our seabed. Nigel, over to you. Hello, Stuart. Uh, could you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. That's great. OK, and you got the presentation, I hope. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nigel Townsend. I'm the uh, current chair of Oz Seabed. Um, I'm also the assistant director of National Hydrography, Australian Hydrography Office. And uh, I recently took over from Kim Picard, who's having a bit of a holiday at the moment, uh, and will be the chair of Oz Seabed for the next couple of years. So I'd like to give you an update on uh, the activities of our seabed and also the data collection activities in, in the Australian uh, region. Uh, one of the things we have done with our seabed is we undertook an economic study of the value of our seabed mapping, which is uh, supporting uh, our, our activities and, and getting more funding to increase the, the work that we're doing. Um, and Australia obviously has a very large uh, area of seabed to map and the third largest jurisdiction in the world. Um, at our seabed, we're, we're working towards a uh, revised strategy, which we'll publish shortly, but we're really focused on on, uh, on coverage, on, on products, uh, making sure that we, we're producing data that our, our users need, and building awareness of, of seabed mapping um, and the uh, value of our seabed to the Australian government and community. Um, so just an update on, on what we've been up to. Uh, we have increased the data, amount of data that's published on the LC the data portal, um, and that's always been uh, updated. Uh, there's quite a bit of activity collecting more and more data uh, from a range of uh, government and community efforts. Um, we're building new data infrastructure um, to, to um, be able to publish more data. And we're developing new tools and guidelines to uh, provide quality insurance and, and collection compilations um, to for everything from uh, collecting data to publishing the uh, the data. No, and no, we're continuing. Can I just interrupt there? Uh, are you sharing your screen for your presentation? Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, it's not. It's not showing. <clears throat> Hang on. Is it there now? Okay, yeah, we've, we've got something there now, yeah. Maybe, maybe if you could put it into the full presenter mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Do you that's want me to go back a bit on that? Uh, if, if that's where you are at the moment, maybe just carry on from that. Okay, all right, so I was just highlighting the uh, competition, the activities have been underway. Um, so currently on our seabed, we have over 2 million square kilometres of, of data. We have uh, 38 new surveys contributed in the 21-22 year, 
and over um, excuse me, 23,000 downloads in the last year from the old seabed portal of uh, seabed data. But the challenge for us is we know that there's a, a 17 million square kilometers of data locked up in the, our uh, seabed mapping community. Um, so the challenge is to uh, get this data made publicly available through our seabed and then to publish it through the, uh, the uh, portal, which is also a challenge um, which we, we are working on. So just looking at the data collection effort, uh, data collection is a, is, a, is a team effort in Australia. So OzSeabed is the publishing platform. The data collection is uh, uh, undertaken by a number of agencies. The National Hydrography Program at the AHO has the uh, HIP, Hydrogen Ministry Partnership Program, which is in its second year. It is now collected over 25,000 square kilometres of predominantly shallow water, high resolution multi beam data. This data is uh, um, collected using our annual plan, which we call a Hydro Scheme. These are available on the Australian Hydrographic Office website. You can uh, see where we're going and, and the quality of the data. Um, and uh, we have to date collected, uh, completed about 21 projects, and that data will shortly be published on OzSeabed. And you can see how we're, we're building up our coverage in the shallow water areas, uh, primarily focused on, on uh, shipping but but trying to increase the the coverage of multi beam coverage in in the eez There's some of the areas that have been achieved by by him over several years um, we also have the national marine facility which has the rv investigator and they've been conducting uh, survey activities uh, around australia in the deep water and down towards antarctica the New South Wales government has collected uh, quite a bit of monitoring data and mapped the entire coastline with LIDAR, which is now available on the, on the, the site. Um, James Cook University has been uh, uh, targeting the Great Barrier Reef and, and has created crowdsourced uh, bathymetry activities using uh, a number of vessels uh, working in the Great Barrier Reef region. There's also uh, an activity of Western Australia to, to uh, map the deeps using uh, uh, of the Manura Foundation and the Schmidt the Ocean Institute, as was previously mentioned, had a voyage around Australia during 2021 and collected uh, over 200,000 square kilometres of modeling data that is now available on our seabed. The data infrastructure, um, we continue to uh, publish data, which is uh, available on the website. Uh, we are optimising the cloud infrastructure um, and working with our, uh, our partners to uh, collect other contributors, uh, working with the West Australian Department of Transport at the moment to get them to come on as a contributor. And we're preparing to publish the HIP data at a 30 metre resolution through um, our seabed. We'll also be working on a range of tools, uh, like I mentioned before, Quax, which is a, a, a QC troll tool for multi beam data collection. We've published uh, the multi beam guidelines and we're working on some SDB guidelines and some LIDAR guidelines. Uh, we're working with uh, the GRMNT to uh, develop a prototype using OzSeabed where we can use the GRMRT to generate some uh, gridded data on the fly. Uh, we have a survey coordination tool that is used to coordinate uh, mapping activities across the Australian and all uh, the community. Uh, we've built into that a HIP survey request tool so people can request uh, areas to be considered for the HIP program. Uh, and we've uh, up, got a layer of upcoming surveys so people can advertise where they're going surveying and, and coordinate their activities. And more recently, we've updated a national areas of interest uh, layer where people can indicate their areas of interest and, and again helps coordinate activities and reduce duplication. All these tools are available on the uh, on the OzSeabed website. Um, so for 2021-22, uh, we had the HIP Project Scheme 2021 complete. We had the Marine National Facility Voyages with Investigator. We've been doing the best rate GMRT demo and that is progressing. Uh, the Australian Marine Parks have been undertaking survey in their parks. Uh, we're tracking down 3D seismic derived data from uh, the oil and gas industry. Um, and there are other activities such as AIMS, uh, Antarctic Division surveys and, and, and state government activities uh, on their coastal strips. So the future of mapping uh, down under as we go forward, uh, we have the HIP program, which is a partnership between government and industry to, to map the EEZ, predominantly focused in 
depths less than 200 metres. The Marine National Facility is uh, the RV investigator undertaking deep water mapping. And we have the uh, new ENA, which is our new uh, Antarctic icebreaker, undertaking Antarctica surveys, uh, as well as its uh, resupply missions. We have AIMS doing tropical water mapping. Uh, we're expanding the crowdsource uh, vessels through uh, our James Cook University. Uh, we recently uh, completed, um, there was a, a IIC uh, sponsored uh, Cap B training for hydrographic surveyors with Deakin University and another one to take off later on this year. Um, and there's a, a new center for Antarctic and Southern Ocean technology being developed in, in uh, Tasmania. So there's an indication of the areas that are going to be undertaken over the next year. Um, survey activities in, in support of HIP for the next financial year have already commenced. Um, and uh, as are other activities, uh, potential lighter activities of the southwest coast, um, which will also expand the coverage of uh, coastal data. And some uh, more activity in the Antarctic regions with the Naina. So we continue to uh, um, engage with our stakeholders, uh, capturing their, their requirements, uh, publishing data. We're trying to uh, in enhance the community by staying connected and engaging them with webinars. Uh, we have a cross-sector steering committee now that's quite average, quite, sorry, quite engaged with uh, the, the community. Um, we're capturing the needs of the community and coordinating the survey activities to reduce uh, duplication of effort. And, and that is who is the All Seabets community um, and uh, encourage everyone to visit the, the website. And if you want to get involved, you are more than, more than welcome to contact us by that email address uh, and get involved in the, the collaboration that is All Seabet. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you for the update. Um, I think the work that All Seabet does is uh, pretty outstanding. Um, right across the board in engaging, collaborating, making data available and uh, as a tool for planning and identifying areas that have already been mapped, but also putting forward areas of interest. Um, certainly a busy time and you've got plenty of uh, plenty of data coming in. Um, so uh, that's really great to see. Um, you mentioned the data is being downloaded. Do you keep track of how that data is being used? Any use cases for the data? At the moment, it's it's just we're just tracking the downloads. Um, that's something we could get into is, is working out how people are using it. Um, but uh, it's certainly, uh, uh, there's a lot of download activity um, and we are getting some statistics on it, on, on how it's been downloaded. Right. Uh, so if you've got any questions for Nigel, then please put them in the chat or, or raise your hand. Um, Kevin. Uh, Kevin. Uh, yes, thank you, Nigel. So what, uh, if you're happy, um, one of the things I'm, I do talk a lot about the OzCB and the Australian government is the Deloitte report that was underdone um, that did the value proposition for the benefits of seabed mapping. So if you're happy, um, can I drop the link to the Deloitte's report into the chat for everyone to have? Because it's a sort of document that that a lot of countries are really struggling with how to convince their 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 own governments about the value of seabed mapping. And I thought that the, uh, the the Deloitte's report that was done for the Australian government is a very very good example of that. Yeah, I, I don't so think there's an issue with that. I just noticed uh, Scott just came on there. Scott, you're happy for that to be published? Absolutely, love to circulate that, Kevin. Um, yeah. You've got the link. Yeah, f feel free yeah, to just, spread I've, that far and wide. I've just, I've just dropped it into the chat now because I think, I mean, I, it's an outstanding report and there's not many global examples of value propositions for seed bed mapping and, and this is one of the mm. outstanding ones. So um, I do like uh, to encourage the people um, in the audience to download that report and read it. Um, and really get a good understanding about how Australia has approached uh, this whole problem about, you know, what is the, what is the value uh, of seabed mapping to the uh, to their economy? Mm. Great, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, there's a comment in there from uh, Shintani from Jevco. Um, will you show us the the first three slides? Yes. Uh, I, I'm Kevin or hi, I may be able to answer, but uh, the presentations will they be made available?
Uh, yes, yes, they will. So I think what we'll do uh, in the interest of time, um, if yeah. you're happy, Nigel, if you just give us a PDF of it and, and we'll just uh, include it, those PDF of everybody's presentations um, later on. Yep. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and again, thank, thank you, Nigel. OK, so if we uh, move on to uh, Emily Twiggs, who's Senior Project Scientist with EOMAP in Australia. And uh, she, her topic is satellite drive bathymetry in the Pacific. Emily, good to see you again, and uh, please, please take it away. Thank you, Stuart, and um, thank you for uh, all the organisers for organising such a great event. Let me share my screen and see if this works. OK, it yep. should be coming that. through. Yeah, we can see that, I great. OK, great. So I'm Senior Project Scientist uh, based out of Perth, so it's still morning here and um, I basically uh, project manage most of the projects in, in our, our region of the world down here. Um, today I'll talk to you about satellite derived bathymetry, um, how we're mapping the gaps with uh, the CBER 2030 program and, and a few other different projects that we're doing and some recent innovations. So for those of you and oh, my mouse isn't working. There we go. So and I can, there's a lot of familiar faces and, and names here, so I know we've worked with a lot of you. But for those of you who might need a brief introduction, we're a private technology company and we focus on satellite data analytics and software solutions. Um, our expertise is in aquatic environments, so um, we're the first provider of satellite derived bathymetry. Uh, back in, uh, actually I've got that wrong, it's back in 2006. Um, we do habitat mapping and water quality monitoring, so they're our big three. And we every year we organise the annual International SDB Day Conference. Um, we're global, we have offices in USA, Australia, Indonesia and Dubai. Our team is growing quite fast and we have our HQ in a beautiful castle in the uh, Seafeld region of uh, just outside Munich. Um, we ha here's some of the team. There's happy bunch. There's about 35 of us now, and um, lots of different. Uh, we've got mathematicians and physicists and software engineers and developers. Um, much of the team is based in our labs in Germany, and um, we also have uh, many, many users and networks, obviously, around the globe. We last year, for example, we did around 100 projects. Uh, we had 30% growth and we served around 35 countries and used 20 different satellite sensors. So our network, network is expanding. Our biggest um, clients are hydrographic offices uh, and marine surveyors, but we also have engineers and environmental consultancies, energy suppliers, um, intergovernmental organisations, non-profits and NGOs and obviously academia. So satellite derived bathymetry, for those who haven't used it, we use multi-spectral satellite data. Um, we have resolutions down from 0.5 meters up to sort of 30 meter spatial resolution and mapping depth. Uh, in the Pacific, we're, we're very lucky with lots of coral reefs, so we can get down to around 20 to 30 to 30 meters. But generally it's around 1.2 uh, of a secchi disk depth. So we're looking at optically clear waters. Um, we use a fully physics-based depth, depth retrieval. So essentially we are doing the inverse of the pathway of the sunlight through to the uh, seafloor back to the sensor. And we use very um, sophisticated algorithms to, to map the seafloor. And we have, um, you know, the benefits are, are many, but it's global access. There's no mobilization. Um, there's obviously verified quality and workflow, uh, lots of cost savings and very, very quick turnaround in, in days to weeks. And it's fit for purpose. So we have lots of different, uh, many, many uses for bathymetry. Um, hydrographic surveying and charting is obviously our biggest one at the moment, uh, but also baseline habitat mapping, coastal monitoring and management, uh, oceanographic modelling, coastal infrastructure, so pipeline crossings and jetties and ports, uh, port operations, uh, disaster impact assessment, um, maritime boundary disputes, and also um, obviously for regional global mapping initiatives such as EMODnet in Europe and CBID 2030 initiative. Um, so I'll just talk about some key projects. Some of these are in the Pacific, some aren't, but that one of the big ones that we had, we've had an incredible 12 months, um, no signs of SDB sort of uptake uh, slowing down. The big one was with the UK Hydrographic Office, so we're the SDB framework provider for the next three to five years. Um, and we've recently just developed, um, delivered Belize, so 9,000 square kilometers of, uh, of SDB for um, two meter resolution um, using Worldview 2. We also did some Sentinel 
Model 2, so that's 10 metres, and the Planet Super Dove data as well. Uh, one of the key projects as well was in Vanuatu, so we mapped the entire archipelago of Vanuatu. This was through CSIRO for the Climate Information Services for Resilient Development Vanuatu project. Um, the aims of the project are basically to standardise science-based climate information. Um, as part of the project, the CSIRO needed more up-to-date bathymetry, especially around those shallow water areas, and we um, so we did 10 meter SDB grids for the entire archipelago. Um, this is going to be used for hydrodynamic wave and biogeochemical models amongst others um, and what CSIRO, uh, CSIRO were finding is with the Jebco data um, because there's a lack of information in the shallow waters there tends to be artifacts so we get these big sort of deep trenches that don't exist um, we obviously did the SDB and, and we did some multi-source bathymetry grids for them and there's no longer any artifacts in those kind of shallow waters. So it's very important to get these areas mapped. Um, we also have been doing lots of mapping for Geoscience Australia over the last year and, and especially this year. Um, we're actually currently mapping the Kimberley coastline for them at 10 metres and offshore W uh, reefs and we're um, doing uh, a few Pacific countries at 10 metres as well for reef, reef research and management. Um, the data will eventually go to Seabed 2030 and also it will be used to update the uh, Northwest Australia grids that, uh, grids that Dr. Rob Beeman from G JCU is, um, is putting together. Um, so all this SDB for GA, they, it will be uh, aiding in management of jurisdictions and obviously eventually the data will be going towards Seabed um, and the Seabed 2030 programme. Another wonderful project that we did, this wasn't actually doing full SDB, but what we can do as well is look at shoals uh, very, very quickly within a day or two. This was for the our, um, the research vessel Nuina, the, the new icebreaker, which is the most advanced polar research vessel um, in the world. And they wanted to uh, basically try and identify any features uh, that may have uh, caused them any problems. They're basically uncharted waters and often too dangerous for, for boat-based surveys. And most of the year they're covered by sea ice. So with satellite imagery we can go in and see when the ice is uh, is free and generally sort of February March there, there's there's a small period where we can so we went in there and we're able to identify quite a few areas um, for them and these uh, are going to be used for um, updating um, the approaches and notices to mariners and to advise their intention to update the, their charts in due course. Um, and we have so mapping the gaps in terms of uh, seabed 2030 um, and other projects. We have been involved with the eModNet bathymetry portal for the European Marine Observation and Data Network uh, initiated by the European Commission. Um, this is a consortium over 400 data providers for Europe and um, we've been doing this since 2016. We've done over 40, I think it's over 14 square kilometres now and the data um, is harvested by Jebco into uh, with every new release. So we've been supporting the project and that goes to Seabed 2030 as well. Um, direct projects that we've been doing recently. This was one with uh, Stuart at Linz and um, Kevin at Niwa. And um, a few years ago, back in 2018, we did a very large project uh, through Linz and working with IX Blue to map um, six and a half thousand square kilometres of SDB through Tonga um, and other um, Pacific nations, including the Cook Islands. So for this project, this was for last year, we did another uh, three areas for the Cook Islands, including two um, atolls, uh, Puka Puka and Saguaro, and we did a two metre SDB using archived and tasked uh, Worldview 2 imagery. Um, so these are very remote and at risk reefs. And this, this data will go directly to CEPA 2030. And um, the, the charts have now been updated for these areas using the SDB information as well as other survey data. Um, and um, there's some great reviews from, from I won't, oh, sorry. Some great reviews from Kevin. Uh, to measure the depth of an ocean, you would traditionally have to send out a boat with an echo sounder, which costs a lot of money and can be dangerous, especially around rough seas or shallow seas. With satellites, we can ex access extremely remote locations with less carbon footprint, and we don't have to put people in harm's way. Um, so this was for the press release. And for Stuart, the technology and process are really clever. The satellite can see the seafloor in exquisite detail, um, but to derive water depth, the software needs to get rid of shadows and waves, etc. So it strips away the water and uses complex algorithms to produce depth 
depth estimations. It then creates a map of colorings of what the seafloor would look like without any water, which we can then use. It's really great. So thank you, Stuart, for that one. Um, we're also doing a very large project last year. We did the east last year and the west of the Federated States of Micronesia. So this is um, over seven and a half thousand kilometers of STB for all the shallow waters using a combination of 10 meter and 30 meter resolution satellite sensors um, down to around 25 meter water depth uh, using uh, multiple images from 2015 to 2021. So this is uh, directly for the CEPA 2030 program as well. Um, we have also recently done the um, another couple of reefs. We've got Helen Island and Palau and Manihi Atoll in uh, French Polynesia, both at 10 meter resolution, going directly to the CEPA 2030 program. Now we have, um, we encourage all of our clients to um, basically uh, contribute to the CEBA 2030 program um, as well. Uh, one of the recent projects is the Great Barrier Reef, so this will be fed directly into the program. So all that 3,000 reefs mapped at 10 metre resolution back in 2019. So the data is actually freely available on the GBR Reef Explorer portal on the Gabrumpa website. Um, and this, this, this data will go directly to those. And it's also on the Seabed portal as well. So in terms of innovation, we've had some um, huge advancements in the last few years. Uh, we have been using physics-based SDB since we started. It, it basically corrects environmental factors at pixel level, so atmospheric corrections, adjacency, sun glint, for example. Um, and as I said before, we're using, we're basically mapping the inverse of the light pathway through the to the seafloor and back up to the sensor. Um, now, big um, advancements in automating uh, and processing, automated processing. We have our Eolitic Swift, uh, which is a web app which combines AI image recognition and satellite metadata information. Within minutes, we can rank the best images according to conditions like example clouds, sun glint, and turbidity. We also have our um, multi-image processing, which reduces noise um, to overcome local compatibility and cloud gaps. It also increases accuracy and scales up our processing efficiency, making everything very quick. Um, we also use NASA's space lasers. So we have the ISAT-2 satellite, which is an ice cloud and land elevation satellite, um, which has on board ATLAS, which is the advanced topographic laser altimeter system, which carries a green laser. Um, it sends 10,000 pulses per per second down to the earth uh, and uh, each pulse has 20 trillion photons per pulse. Um, so they basically measure the, the, the photons that are coming back and we can use these uh, remote bathymetric points which come in uh, these um, track lines. We can use these to verify uncertainties in the SDB as well. And we have a, a growing database of this information that we use on our projects. Um, some of the latest innovation, we have our SDB software. So we have Wattcore X, which is very, very powerful commercial desktop SDB software. It's only used by navies um, worldwide uh, if they have the in-house expertise and it's based on our physics-based SDB con uh, concepts and generates SDB without the need for on-site data. Um, so we uh, have recently signed last year with uh, the Australian Hydrographic to continue the use of Wattcore X on the programs and, and uh, for example, uh, the Indonesia Indonesian Naval uh, Hydrographic and Oceanographic Centre are also using the software. Now, one of the last, uh, um, this was very fresh, this is last month, we uh, launched the um, SDB online. So it's a game changer for most of our clients. It was launched last month at the Canadian Hydrographic Conference. Um, it basically implements all the approaches uh, of our physics-based processing, our latest AI techniques and multi-image processing within a high performance, extremely, extremely user-friendly web app. I've had a play around, it's absolutely amazing and extremely quick. You can get bathymetry for shallow water areas within 30 minutes to an hour. Um, so you, um, many of our clients uh, are also implementing it within their own software systems using API uh, machine to machine um, interfaces. So that's a really big. So in summary, um, latest, latest developments. So uh, we've obviously got big developments in cloud computing and automation um, and physics-based multi-image 
processing for SDB, um, AI, uh, artificial um, intelligence scene selection, improving quality and reliability and efficiency. Um, we have the EMAP SDB online, which is a, a big game changer and it allows easy access on demand with API interfaces for our clients. For example, Fugro is now using it within their software systems and QPS. Um, so it's very scalable. We are essentially able to um, map shallow waters very quickly. Um, we can map the gaps. Um, SCB can map the gaps for around two thirds of the global sh shallow waters and we can actually do this very quickly. So our ongoing mapping um, priorities, uh, obviously for the priority areas around Australia and beyond um, and contributions to the Seabed 2030 program and obviously other uh, platforms such as um, Ausseabed and the EMODnet program in Europe. Um, so um, I'll leave it there. So thanks for listening. Um, if you have any questions, um, please obviously I'll answer them here, but please get in touch at um, my email and um, um, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you, Emily. Uh, yes, yeah, some great work uh, there from EMAP and uh, working collaborating with uh, Super 2030 and other contributors to collect data in uh, remote locations, very remote areas in, in the Pacific, uh, where yep. it is a big challenge to actually uh, collect data uh, in traditional methods. So uh, that's that's great. Um, there's a question there. Um, would you tell us what EO stands for? Extremely Earth outstanding. <laughs> Extremely outstanding. Uh, Earth observation mapping. Sure. So that's where the EO map comes from. <laughs> Right. Okay, that's that's great. Emily. If there's any other questions, then please put them into the chat, um, yeah. and uh, Emily can can respond to those. If um, I don't, um, if I don't get back to you quickly, I have a sick five year old, so I might have to, I might have to head off soon. But yeah, please, right. the question, the questions can be forwarded to me or, or get in contact on my email. That's great. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. Okay, we'll uh, now pass on to uh, Dr. Jenny Black, who's a data, te data technician with GNS Science. Uh, and uh, Jenny will be talking about bathymetric mapping under the Rossi ice. So going from one challenging area of remote locations to, to another one. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Stuart. Um, can you just confirm you can see um, my slides? Yes, we can see that. Cool, that's great. Um, Tanika Turn, hello everyone. Thanks for listening to this talk. Um, we've heard lots of really interesting talks so far today and yesterday about collecting bathymetry data from vessels, various different types of vessels, and utilizing data from satellites. So I'm going to talk about something quite different, and that's how we measure bathymetry data when the seabed's covered with not only water but also ice and the kind of challenges around doing that. Those of you not so familiar with the Antarctic, who've mostly worked in the Pacific area, I'm talking about the Ross Ice Shelf and an area called Discovery Deep here. So all my maps are going to be this way up with the South Pole up towards the top of the page and the Pacific and New Zealand down towards the bottom of the page. So this is on um, Ross Island here with Scott Base and McMurdo Station and about 150 kilometres south of that is an area called Discovery Deep. And it's called Discovery Deep because it's thought to be or was thought to be the deepest um, bathymetry under the Ross Ice Shelf. The colour scale we've got underneath there is with our current best bathymetry model with colours ranging from white, which is very shallow, down to dark blue at the deepest bit. So that's thought to be the deepest bit, but not very much is known about it or wasn't known about it till we went there this summer. So if we now zoom into this area here, so again, um, we've got the South Pole up towards the top, Scott Base down towards the bottom. This yellow box here is what was called our polygon of safety. This is the area we're allowed to work in. A desktop study had been carried out looking at various um, airborne data to check the work in any crevasses and hopefully nothing dangerous could happen to us there. So we couldn't go outside of the area, but we could do what we wanted to do inside the area in terms of collecting data. So before we went there, there were two different types of data sets that existed. There were a couple of different ice shelf surveys, which we can see there with the red and the green dots collected in the 60s and 70s. So only a handful of points in that area with a couple of points suggesting that it really is quite deep and becoming shallower 
off to the sides, but not very many data points at all, given the scale of the area. And then as well as that data, there's also these coloured lines on top, which come from the Rosetta airborne data set, which was collected a few years ago and collected various different data sets. But I've plotted here the um, airborne gravity with the blue being the lower gravity, which we would imagine would correlate with lower bathymetry and the red that would correlate with higher bathymetry. So this has all given us an idea that somewhere around this area is very deep, but exactly how deep and the nature of it, very unknown. Um, what, as we were looking at this, we did wonder if perhaps the deepest bit was going to be outside our polygon of safety, but we only had one season, so we were limited with how much data we could collect and the chances of hitting the deepest point was kind of unlikely, but we did the best we could and I suggested that we orientated our data collection area to this end of our box to try and get to the deepest bit that we could. So. Our goals, well, primarily it was to learn more about Discovery Deep, how deep it was, what it's like, but particularly we were looking there to evaluate it as a potential site for future drilling. The idea being if this is very deep, it will have accumulated a lot of sediments over a very long time period and may have a very complete sediment record and therefore be a really good place to target the drilling. But obviously you don't just want to send in 30 people all sorts of stuff and drill at one point without knowing a little bit more about whether that's going to be a good site or where the best site is. And we had a couple of other objectives as well, goals. One was to ground truth the Rosetta data and another was to provide control points for the Ross Ice Shelf bathymetry model. So the model I showed in the previous slides, our best guess model, best estimate to date, but the more control points we have, the better that can guide the model, the better the inversion of the gravity data can be. So we plan to do that by primarily collecting a 30 kilometre long seismic transect, which will give us the depth and a little bit about the geology below. And we hope that would cross the deepest part that we could. And we also collected some surface gravity measurements using the Lacoste-Romberg gravity meter in a profile and a grid. But I won't talk about that much today because that was more aimed at perhaps looking a little bit deeper than the bathymetry. And then finally, we had a sort of sneaky extra objective to trial a new to us seismic streamer system that the Alfred Wegener Institute lent to us to see how that would compare. And they'd used it on the ice before, though not quite in this sort of location, but it hadn't really been used in conjunction with the more traditional seismic transect. So they've been able to collect both in the same place we hoped would guide future um, expeditions out there. It was a small group of five of us, as I mentioned, it's a lot easier to send in a small team of five to do a kind of reconnaissance survey before sending in 30 drillers. So the five of us were made up from two universities in New Zealand, University of Otago and Victoria University of Wellington, and from GNS Science. And we spent, I think, about 40 something days out there together on the Ross Ice Shelf. So the main um, objective or the main sort of thing we were doing, as I said, was um, collecting our 30 kilometre long seismic line. And the way we did that, before we could even collect any seismic data, we needed to bury our charges. This wasn't like doing marine seismic where you could just deploy your streamer, you'd have your air guns or whatever, and you could just let them off whenever you wanted. We needed to prepare our charges and bury them. And past years had concluded that with this system, the best bet was to bury the charges about 25 metres deep and use relatively small charges. More um, energy would just reverberate more in the ice. So we had um, 800 gram Pentex charges, which you can see me holding one there. And drilling a 25 metre deep hole in the ice is not entirely trivial. We used a hot water drill here. And to be able to generate enough hot water, you needed about 200 litres of water, which meant a lot of digging of snow to fill up the tank, to melt it, to get it hot enough, which we would then um, drop our lance down the hole. See here me um, carefully lowering it down, trying to keep it as straight as possible so that the charge would drop all the way to the bottom. And then once the lance had reached the bottom, it's another bit of manual labour because it needs to come back up again. The lance, when it's dry, weighs about 11 kilograms when it's full of water and you've got 25 metres of I think inch diameter hose going down also full of water. It's quite heavy to pull up. So it was nice having five of us. We could rotate that job round between us and all take our turn. And then as soon as the lance has been pulled out, we would 
drop the charge down before anything froze back up and tie it off to the flag on the surface and then fill it with snow and leave it to freeze in ready for when we'll be shooting. So we had 120 shots. It took us about two weeks to drill all of those holes and a lot of digging of snow, a lot of manual labour, hard work, but a lot of fun. And having five of us was really helpful because it only really needs four people, but it's really good once you've got it going in the morning to be able to run it continuously and not as soon as you stop, if you all had a lunch break for half an hour, you'd risk it cooling down and water in the pipes freezing and really bad things happened. So having five was meant we could rotate round with who was having a break or whatever and no one ended up doing too much. But it was still a lot of really hard work and it took two weeks before we could even start collecting data. There were some benefits of running the hot water drill, which was quite temperamental and Hamish did a great job of keeping it running. But one day when it was relatively warm, we um, our tank that we were normally melting snow to generate water, we heated it up and we all had a little hot tub at the end of the day, which was really nice. The um, chimney on the boiler has been designed to be extra tall and have a grill at the top so you can toast sandwiches in there. You can do two peoples at a time, so we'll take it in turns to have our lunch. That's Matt and I eating our sandwiches toasted over the um, exhaust which does mean you have a slight sort of perhaps flavour of diesel fumes but you get a nice warm lunch which is good and you can dry your gloves on it as well which was also quite handy. So after we'd spent two weeks preparing all of our charges getting them all nicely buried all the way along our profile we could then actually start collecting some data and the way we did that is we would um, detonate our shot in the centre of a string of 96 geophones and they're all um, 10 metres apart along the profile and buried around 50 centimetres deep. And we tried to bury them as deep as it was practical to do because we were using relatively low amount of energy for this sort of survey with the 800 gram Pentax charge, which meant really you needed to bury the geophones reasonably well, otherwise they could be quite affected by wind noise or other noise. So we would get all of our 96 geophones buried. And then once the first shot had been detonated in the middle of the array, Hamish would move the shot system up 240 metres and we would move the recording system, which we can see here, up 240 metres. And then the other three of us would dig up our 24 geophones between us and leapfrog them to the front of the array. And then with Andrew's help, the four of us would dig back in the geophones and bury them 50 centimetres deep and then it would roll around again. So again, this is quite a slow, laborious process. There's a lot of manual labour involved, a lot of making sure everything is actually connected properly. When it's cold and you've got big gloves on, getting the geophones connected to the cable can sometimes be a bit fiddly and would be in a rush to get round and get the next rotation. Sometimes when Andrew would hook up the computer, would realise that geophone um, 91 wasn't plugged in and we'll have to go back and deal with that. But we got into a really good routine and it took about two weeks to collect that data. So after about a month, because we had a few bad weather days, we actually had a 30 kilometre long line of some beautiful seismic data so we could see what was happening beneath us. And it looked like there was around 450 metres of ice on the top which was about what was expected, and then about a thousand metres of um, seawater before we then got to the bathymetry underneath. And the deepest point we reached was about 14, 50 metres beneath sea level, which was perhaps slightly deeper, but in the ballpark of what we'd expected. And it just rose quite gradually up to about 12, 30 metres below sea level to the eastern end of our line. What we don't know is, is this actually the deepest point here? Or is this just a little blip, like there's a few little blips there, which happened to be at the end of days as well as we were going along. We thought, oh, perhaps we've got to the deepest point today and then the next day it would go a bit deeper. So maybe that's what's happening here. There's a little blip and it's going to carry on deeper off to the west. Or maybe this is the deepest point, at least along this profile. Of course, it might be deeper and I suspect it probably is off to the north. But some nice um, high quality data there. And if we zoom in a little bit to the sediments here, we can um, see some structure here in the top 
200 metres or so of sediments. You'll notice there's a double reflector here for the seafloor and again for the multiple, and that's because our shots were 25 metres deep. So obviously most of the energy will just go straight down and that will give the um, seafloor reflector, but some of it will go up 25 metres, then back down 25 metres and then carry on down. So you get a ghost below that, which can be processed out, I believe, but it's not as straightforward as you might think and it doesn't help with the interpretation. But we can see if you squint a bit, maybe that there is um, sediments here, which is great. We were expecting there to be sediments, so that kind of fits with that. But what we were surprised by is in some places, particularly here and here, the sediments seem to be really steeply dipping, which suggests they're not recent. They've been there long enough to be quite deformed, so they're not the young sediments, a complete sedimentary record that we'd probably expect it. So probably good that people didn't just go and rush in with the drill and start drilling and that we're learning a bit more about the area first. Um, I mentioned we also collected gravity data. This is our seismic profile here. Gravity data is a lot quicker to collect, so we collected a lot more points over a grid, but I won't talk too much about that right now, other than that it's telling a similar story with it, looking like we've got low gravity values and deep of the symmetry out this way and becoming shallow off to the side. And I've, I think, made it clear that the collecting the seismic in that method is quite a slow, laborious process. It took the best part of a month to collect just, just under 30 kilometre line. So we were quite keen to test out a seismic streamer system and see how that would compare. And as I said before, I think we borrowed this from Awi. It was a 300 metre long streamer, which we can see here being towed from a skidoo. The geophones just sit on the streamer and sit just on the surface of the snow. They don't get dug in at all. And then we also had our shots on the surface. We just used 10 metres of deck cord, which we can see here literally lying on the surface. We tried doing a small channel, but actually just putting it on the surface seemed to be comparable. And we would put that just ahead of the streamer and then shoot into the streamer. And the streamer has the same number of geophones. It had 96, but they were much closer together, about three metres apart. This was much faster to collect, but obviously that's only helpful if the data is comparably good. And we only collected a small amount of this because this was a test. We just collected three kilometres of it, so about 10% of what our full line was. So if we have a look now, um, this is the data we collected with the stream on the left, and this is the same little bit um, of the big line I showed you earlier, but with the um, more traditional method that we've used in, on the Ross Shelf in the past with buried shots and buried geophones. And the streamer is probably three times faster to collect, doesn't need as much gear, doesn't need as much fuel, you're not running a hot water drill, there's less to maintain, you don't need as many people. You can see that we just have a seafloor reflected there, there's no ghost beneath it like we had with the um, buried shot, so that's kind of cleaner. It does have lower frequency content and we suspect it's more susceptible to noise, but because we only did a three kilometre test and that was how much um, deck cord we had, we couldn't test it in different weather conditions. But both methods show a really clear seabed reflector, show some structure in the sediments underneath, but are limited to about 200 metres of sediments. And so our kind of conclusion was really that's a really good method to be using. If you can collect three times as much data that's a comparable quality and you don't have as much to maintain, you don't need as many people, you don't need as much fuel, that's probably a win really given how much data could be collected in this area and how little is known about it already. So in summary and before we take our flight home, um, we can conclude that Discovery Deep is deep, it's aptly named, it's at least um, 1450 metres deep, but we don't know everything about it. We don't know if the area gets deeper, is it deeper to the west, to the north? You'd have to um, collect more data to discover that. We don't really know what kind of feature it is, um, what the form of it is, what the shape of it is, is it an elongate feature, is it a channel, is it a basin, is it steep sided on any of the sides? It looked to be um, continuously dipping down on the side that we were looking at. What happens on the other side is still an unknown. Um, we could see there were sediments, we could see we were deformed enough not to be recent. 
We don't know if there's younger sediments, perhaps closer towards the Transantarctic Mountains or in a deeper bit of the region, maybe. Um, we don't really know the geological context of what's happening there, and you've just got a small snapshot of what's happening. But on the plus side, we've really concluded that the streamer method's a lot more efficient. You can collect a lot more data for your time. So perhaps if people go back, and no one's going to go back this summer, I believe, but if people do go back the following summer or in the future, hopefully a lot more data can be collected and we can learn a lot more for a similar amount of effort. So thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Jenny. That that was really interesting and um, very different to the warm climes of the Pacific. Um, if there's any if there's any questions, well, please stick them in the chat or or raise your hand. Um, so now we know what goes on in the ice, uh, hot tubs and the like. Um, so quite a question for me for this for the surface streamer. Did that did you attain this the same depth penetration as with the um, the buried charges, so you would you think you would have measured the um, the deepest point. Um, so on. yes, I think that um, it seemed to be it gave very comparable um, results. The depth it got was very similar. We chose to do our bit in the centre of the profile because um, you had to do it somewhere and that looked to be a bit that had relatively clear structure in the sediments. So we wanted to see if it could pick up what it picked up mm -hmm. there. Had we had more time and more um, depth cord, more explosives and so on, that would be a good way, I think, in my mind, of continuing the profile along to the um, west and then maybe doing a, um, a tie profile to the north and identify where the deepest point was. But I think that would be a very reliable way of doing that. Right. OK. Uh, any other any questions for uh, for Jenny before we move move on to our last presentation? I'll take that as a no. Thank you again, Jenny. Uh, so our last presentation is a pre-recorded uh, presentation from Dr. Vicky uh, Farina, who is a senior research scientist at uh, Lamont 30 Earth Observation in Columbia. At Columbia University and uh, higher if you can run the, uh, the recording that would be great. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Vicki Farini. I'm a senior research scientist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. I'm going to give you a brief update today about the global multi-resolution topography synthesis, also known as GMRT. GMRT is first and foremost a data synthesis. It's also an infrastructure for delivering elevation data in a variety of formats, including grids, images, profiles, and points, all at user-defined locations, and also comprehensive metadata and access to source data. GMRT is a tiling scheme for efficiently storing and delivering these multi-resolutional data, and it's a scalable methodology for QA, QC, and integration of multi-beam sonar data collected from multiple cruises and it's really well suited for integrating multi-beam data during transit. I should note that GMRT has been and still is supported for many years by the US National Science Foundation. GMRT is maintained as raster tile sets. This includes both topography and bathymetry, and it's how we're able to combine data from multiple sources and multiple uh, resolutions. We maintain this synthesis simultaneously in three projections, so Mercator, North Polar, and South Polar. The compil compilation is available in a variety of formats, as I previously said, and we're really trying to make the content accessible by both specialists and non-specialists alike. The comprehensive metadata that we curate to accompany this data synthesis includes full attribution to contributors, summary statistics, swath extinction plots, as is shown here in the, da of the data report, which gives us a sense of how the swath system is performing, um, and also access to the source data files. So there's a whole lot of information in addition to the data synthesis that we make available to people, really allowing them to get all the way back to the source data um, and also to use the products very easily as necessary. The way our raster components are brought together is through what we call a grid composer. So we maintain these different raster data at the native resolution, 
So what's shown here as an example is the Jebco 2021 grid, which is roughly 400 meters, composes or comprises the majority of the ocean, at um, much of which is uh, based on international data contributions and also, of course, predicted bathymetry. We have topography data um, all over the world at resolutions from 10 to 30 meters. We have contributed grids that have been made available by the scientific community that range in resolution from meter to hundreds of meters in resolution. And then we have what we refer to as the GMRT multi-beam synthesis. So a whole other layer of data that we curate ourselves, we review, we integrate, that exists globally at roughly 100 meters and in some locations at better resolution than that. So all of these raster data sets are basically maintained as four discrete elevation components, all at multiple resolutions. We can update these independently and on different schedules. And our grid composer is used to on the fly, bring these different data sources together to deliver custom grids to users in a variety of formats, um, and that is all done based on the resolution that's requested by the user and also by the resolution of the source data that's available. The way that you can access GMRT is through a variety of interfaces, including a map tool, web application that is uh, accessible on our website. There's a screenshot of that in the lower left. Uh, this interface is driven by web services, which are all publicly accessible and documented on our website. And there's also a desktop application called GeoMap App shown on the right that makes this data available in an interactive way and allows you to overlay on top of it many, many different data sets. I wanted to point out the uh, methodology or <laughs> the general principle of exchanging data between GMRT and Jebco. So particularly with the multi-beam data that we curate, which is um, sometimes distinct from what's been um, delivered, into the Jebco grid already. So we're taking both raw and processed data. We're running our QA, QC scripts against this and processes uh, uh, with this data <clears throat> so we can compare it with what's already in the GMRT compilation. This then gets made available and integrated with the other components that I just described and accessible through our website, gmrt.org. The process data files, once they've been reviewed, as well as the raw data files are all sent to the IHO DCDB multi-beam archive for public access, where they're made available as they were delivered to that archive. Um, GMRT then takes the multi-beam synthesis component and delivers that, contributes that to the regional centers of Seabed 2030, and that content then gets um, blended into the Jebco grid that's made available to the world. Um, the Jebco grid, of course, then feeds back into GMRT to provide that lower resolution base map uh, for that large percentage of the ocean that has not yet been mapped. Um, I think an important point to make here is that underlying all of this is a focus on public access. And over the years, we really evolved to the point of not only making the data and the data products publicly accessible, but what I'll tell you a little bit more about in a few minutes is how we're making the process and the workflows more accessible so that we can share this knowledge with more people around the world and really build capacity to work through the many terabytes of data that are being acquired and made available. So the current status of GMRT, we're now at version 4.0, which was released in January 2022. This includes the Jebco 2021 um, grid and it has also been contributed, the synthesis has been passed back out for integration to the Jebco 2022 grid. Uh, so that might sound a little confusing, but the point is that we had previously been using the Jebco 2014 grid for the background in the oceans, and we upgraded that and had to make some logic changes to handle the higher resolution Jebco product. So the areas shown in this map on the right that are gray throughout the oceans, are currently what's uh, populated by the Jebco 2021 grid. And the areas that are highlighted in the oceans are data that we have passed on for inclusion into the Jebco 2022 grid. Some stats about the multi-beam data that we have curated into version 4.0 of the synthesis. Just briefly, it's over 1300 cruises dating back to the 1970s. That's data from 43 different ships and 30 different operators hundreds of chief scientists, 
and the total area mapped covers roughly 10.3% of the ocean. So we're really pleased to have made this progress and are really excited about how we're able to accelerate progress by some changes we've made in our workflow and also by working more closely with folks around the world in our community. So the heart of how we assemble data is really at the tools that we use for QA, QC. Um, we make tiled rasters from the swath files. We review them and compare them with underlying data, which is a really important way to catch problems. Um, we also have a dynamic color map or color range that adjusts based on the view. And this we find to be really helpful in identifying quality issues that sometimes slide past people in other, even ourselves in other software tools. Um, so this allows us to really get in the detailed ping edits done and also to address sound velocity profile issues, which are um, much more pervasive than, than I would like to hope or uh, hopefully we can do better as a community by working together with some common tools to do that. Um, so we've been working to make the distributable data processing and curation tools available. Um, really the concept here is to accelerate this process, leverage the work that's being done in the community and try to establish some standards, particularly with respect to the tools and, that we're using and the lenses that we're looking through as we look at this data. Rather than having to go back to raw data all the time, we'd like to be able to leverage process data that people make available. Even if that means doing a little bit of additional work, it's certainly more efficient than going all the way back to raw. So we've um, advanced the state of our um, distributable processing code and workflows and instructions. Uh, again, the goals here are really to enable some standards that are practical and help to deliver fit for purpose products, improving the quality of publicly available process swath files and products, of course. Uh, we really wanna minimize the need for additional processing and or reprocessing. And we wanna accelerate the pace of data integration. We don't want there to be a big time gap between when data is acquired and made publicly available and when it becomes integrated into um, the various products that different stakeholders are trying to create for different uses of bathymetry data. So the code and instructions are available on GitHub uh, in a wiki that's listed there on the bottom of this page. We're constantly updating this and embellishing it with um, new information and videos. We're really excited for people to, to test this out. Uh, we know we have some improvements to make to make it a little bit easier to use, but um, the success that we've had in getting this code delivered out and implemented with various folks, both at sea and um, in their home institutions, has really delivered um, good results in terms of accelerating the rate at which we can move data along and minimizing the need for us to do extra work before we can integrate data into various syntheses. So the key takeaways. GMRT is a data synthesis that contributes to CBED 2030 by feeding curated data into the JEBCO grid and the IHO Data Center for Digital Bathymetry. A variety of the tools that we have um, provide functionality that can help optimize data synthesis and integration. And we're really excited to make that available and help um, improve those with input from the community. These tools are available for use and um, can provide an extra level of QAQC. You can continue to do the work that you're doing to clean and process data with whatever software you use or you're accustomed to using, but we really want to minimize the need for versioning, accelerate the rate of data integration, and key to this, I think, is providing process data in a swath format, not just ASCII or GRID, but swath format such as GSF, so that we can leverage work that's been done and allow um, us to do some further processing if it's necessary when problems are identified later. Um, the plot in the top right here just shows with different versions of GMRT, the, the, the blue color on the bottom of each of those bars is data that we've processed ourselves in-house. Uh, the different colors on top of that are data that have been processed by other people. And so because we've made some modifications to our workflow and we're starting to get these tools out in the community, we're starting to really gain momentum and um, and efficiency and get more people involved in uh, processing and getting data to a common standard. So um, we're really excited about this and would be very happy to work with anyone who's interested 
uh, you can go to our website or reach out to me for more information. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you Hi, for sharing that. Uh, so that brings us to the end of uh, today's session. Um, Kevin, do you want to say anything at the end or do you want another photograph taken? Uh, yes, we do want a photograph taken. Um, so um, now's the time to do that. If you could please turn on your cameras uh, and uh, we'll get a photograph taken. And while everyone's turning on their cameras, I'd just like to um, congratulate and thank all our speakers today. I thought um, an amazing day with some amazing talks. Um, everything from the uh, cold ice to the tropical uh, tropical uh, warms of the Pacific. So I think it was a fantastic day uh, and thank you very much for your speakers. Uh, and Haya, can you um, lead the charge on taking the photos, please? Just while Haya is getting ready too, um, if you do have further questions, um, this chat will be available again tomorrow. So just um, ask questions in the chat or send us an email and we'll make sure that um, we can get those queries sent out to people as well. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and look forward to the final day tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. See you tomorrow.